Section one of In the Nursery of My Book House. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ginger Cucolo. In the Nursery of My Book House. Edited by Olive Bupre Miller. Short Nursery Rhymes. Dance, little baby, dance up high. Never mind, baby, mother is by. Crow and caper, caper and crow. There, little baby, there you go. Up to the ceiling, down to the ground, backwards and forwards, round and round. Dance, little baby, and mother will sing with a merry carol, ding, ding, ding. See, saw, sakura down, which is the way to London town. One foot up, the other foot down. Oh, that's the way to London town. Rockabye, baby, thy cradle is green. Father's a nobleman, mother's a queen, and Betty's a lady and wears a golden ring, and Johnny's a drummer and drums for the king. Pat a cake, pat a cake, baker's man, bake me a cake as fast as you can. Prick it and pat it and mark it with tea and put it in the oven for Tommy and me. How many days has my baby to play? saturday sunday monday tuesday wednesday thursday friday saturday sunday monday this little pig went to the market this little pig stayed at home this little pig had a bite to eat and this little pig had none this little pig cried wee 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 all the way home sleep baby sleep our cottage veil is deep the little lamb is on the green with woolly fleece so soft and clean sleep baby sleep sleep baby sleep down where the woodbines creep be always like the lamb so mild a kind and sweet and gentle child sleep baby sleep johnny shall have a new bonnet and johnny shall go to the fair and johnny shall have a blue ribbon to tie up his bonny brown hair. Oh, here's a leg for a stocking, and here's a foot for a shoe, and he has a kiss for his daddy, and two for his mammy I true. Ring around the roses, pocket full of posies. Hush, 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 we're all tumbled down. Hush, baby, my dolly. I pray you don't cry, and I'll give you some bread and some milk by and by, or perhaps you'd like custard or maybe a tart. Then to either you're welcome with all of my heart. Peas porridge hot, peas porridge cold, peas porridge in the pot nine days old. Some like it hot, some like it cold, some like it in the pot nine days old. End of section one. Recording by Ginger Cucolo. Section two of In the Nursery of My Book House. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ginger Cucolo. In the Nursery of My Book House. Edited by Olive Bupre Miller. The Sleepy Song by Josephine Dascom Bacon. As soon as the fire burns red and low and the house upstairs is still, she sings me a queer little sleepy song of sheep that go over the hill. The good little sheep run quick and soft, their colors are gray and white. They follow their leader, nose and tail, for they must be home by night and one slips over and one comes next and one runs after behind the gray one's nose at the white one's tail the top of the hill they find and when they get to the top of the hill they quietly slip away but one runs over and one comes next their colors are white and gray and one slips over and one comes next the good little gray little sheep i watch how the fire burns red and low and she says that i fall asleep End of section two. Recording by Ginger Cucolo.
Section three of In the Nursery of My Book House. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ginger Cucolo. In the Nursery of My Book House. Edited by Olive Bupre Miller. Bow wow, says the dog. Bow wow, says the dog. Mew mew, says the cat. Grunt grunt goes the hog and squeak goes the rat chirp chirp says the sparrow caw caw says the crow quack quack says the duck and the cuckoo you know so with sparrows and cuckoos with rats and with dogs with ducks and with crows with cats and with hogs a fine song i've made to please you my dear and if it's well sung twill be charming to hear end of section three Recording by Ginger Cucolo. Section 4 of In the Nursery of My Book House. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ginger Cucolo. In the Nursery of My Book House. Edited by Olive Bupre Miller. Nursery Rhymes, Part Two. Rockabye lullaby, rockabye lullaby. Bees on the clover, crooning so drowsily, crying so low. Rockabye lullaby, dear little rover, down into Wonderland, down to the Underland go. Oh, go down into Wonderland go. Hey, my kitten, my kitten, and oh, my kitten, my dreary, such a sweet pet as this was neither far nor neary. Here we go up, 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 here we go down, 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 here we go backwards and forwards, and here we go round, round, round. Ride a cock horse to Banbury Cross to see a fine lady on a white horse, rings on her fingers and bells on her toes, she shall have music wherever she goes. This is the way the ladies ride. Try tree tree tree, try tree tree tree. This is the way the ladies ride. Try tree tree tree, try tree tree tree. This is the way the gentlemen ride. Gallop a trot, gallop a trot. This is the way the gentlemen ride. Gallop a gallop a trot. This is the way the farmers ride, hobble de hoy, hobble de hoy. This is the way the farmers ride, hobble de hobble de hoy. Dickery dickery dock, the mouse ran up the clock. The clock struck one, the mouse ran down. Dickery dickery dock. Goosey goosey gander, where shall I wander? Upstairs and downstairs and in my lady's chamber. Hey diddle diddle, the cat and the fiddle, the cow jumped over the moon. The little dog laughed to see such a sport, and the dish ran away with the spoon. Old Mother Goose, when she wanted to wander, would ride through the air on a very fine gander. Mother Goose had a house, twas built in a wood, where an owl at the door for sentinel stood. Little Robin Redbreast sat upon a rail, Niddle Naddle went his head, Wiggle Waggle went his tail. Bow Wow Wow, whose dog art thou? Little Tommy Tucker's dog, Bow Wow Wow. Hickety Pickety, my black hen, She lays eggs for gentlemen. Gentlemen come every day To see what my black hen doth lay. Right away, right away, Johnny shall ride, and he shall have Pussy Cat tied to one side. He shall have Little Dog tied to the other, and Johnny shall ride to see his grandmother. Dickery, dickery, dare, the pig flew up in the air. The man in brown soon brought him down. Dickery, dickery, dare. Once I saw a little bird come hop, hop, hop. So I cried, Little bird, Will you stop, stop, stop? And was going to the window to say, How do you do? But he shook his little tail, and away he flew. Daffy Down Dilly has come up to town in a yellow petticoat and a green gown. How does my lady's garden grow? 
how does my lady's garden grow with cockle shells and silver bells and pretty maids all in a row there was an old woman of harrow who visited in a wheelbarrow and her servant before knocked loud at each door to announce the old woman of harrow lucy locket lost her pocket kitty fisher found it there was not a penny in it but a ribbon round it robin and richard were two pretty men they lay in bed till the clock struck ten then up starts robin and looks at the sky oh brother richard the sun's very high you go on with the bottle and bag and i'll come after with jolly jack nag end of section four recording by ginger cuckoo Section 5 of In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ginger Cuckoo. In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. Edited by Olive Bupre Miller. The Three Little Kittens. Three little kittens, they lost their mittens, and they began to cry. Oh, Mammy dear, we sadly fear that we have lost our mittens. Lost your mittens, you careless kittens, then you shall have no pie. Meow, meow, meow. No, you shall have no pie. Meow, meow, meow. The three little kittens, they found their mittens, and they began to cry. Oh, Mammy dear, see here, see here. See, we have found our mittens what found your mittens you little kittens then you shall have some pie purr 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 oh thank you for the pie purr 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 end of section five recording by ginger cuckoo Section six of In the Nursery of My Book House. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ginger Cuckoo. In the Nursery of My Book House. Edited by Olive Bupre Miller. Nursery Rhymes. Part three. Wee Willy Winky runs through the town, upstairs and downstairs in his nightgown, rapping at the window, crying through the lock. Are the children all in bed? For it's past eight o'clock. Hippity hop to the barber shop to get a stick of candy. One for you and one for me and one for Sister Mandy. Jog on, jog on the footpath way and merrily jump the stile, boys. A merry heart goes all the day. Your sad one tires in a mile, boys. Sweet and low. Sweet and low, sweet and low, wind of the western sea. Low, low, breathe and blow, wind of the western sea. Over the rolling waters go, come from the dying moon and blow blow him again to me while my little one while my pretty one sleeps sleep and rest sleep and rest father will come to thee soon rest rest on mother's breast father will come to thee soon father will come to his babe in the nest silver sails all out of the west under the silver moon sleep my little one sleep my pretty one sleep cradle song sleep baby sleep thy father's watching the sheep thy mother's shaking the dreamland tree and down drops a little dream for thee sleep baby sleep sleep baby sleep the large stars are the sheep the little stars are the lambs i guess the bright moon is the shepherdess sleep baby sleep smiling girls rosy boys come and buy my little toys monkeys made of gingerbread and sugar horses painted red 
there was an old man and he had a calf and that's half he took him out of the stall and put him on the wall and that's all up in the green orchard there is a green tree the finest of pippins that ever you see the apples are ripe and ready to fall and reuben and robin shall gather them all little bo peep has lost her sheep and doesn't know where to find them leave them alone and they'll come home and bring their tails behind them cock-a-doodle-doo my dame has lost her shoe my master's lost his fiddling stick and knows not what to do cock-a-doodle-doo what is my dame to do till master finds his fiddling stick she'll dance without her shoe cock-a-doodle-doo my dame has found her shoe and master's found his fiddling stick sing cock-a-doodle-doo here am i little jumping joan when nobody's with me i'm always alone little boy blue come blow your horn the sheep's in the meadow the cow's in the corn where is the boy that looks after the sheep he's under the haycock fast asleep handy spandy jack a dandy loved plum cake and sugar candy he bought some at a baker's shop and pleased away ran hop 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 to market to market to buy a fat pig home again home again dancing a jig to market to market to buy a fat hog home again home again jiggity jog to market to market to buy a plum bun home again home again market is done little king boggin he built a fine hall pie crust and pastry crust that was the wall the windows were made of black puddings and white and slated with pancakes you ne'er saw the like tom tom the piper's son he learned to play when he was young but all the tune that he could play was over the hills and far away now tom with his pipe did make such a noise that he surely passed both the girls and the boys and they all stopped still for to hear him play over the hills and far away tom with his pipe did play with such skill that those who heard him could never keep still whenever they heard him they'd all begin to dance even pigs on their hind legs would after him prance end of section six recording by ginger cuckolo section seven of in the nursery of my book house this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ginger Cucolo. In the Nursery of My Book House. Edited by Olive Bupre Miller. I Saw a Ship A Sailing. I saw a ship a sailing, a sailing on the sea. And oh, it was all laden with pretty things for thee. The four and twenty sailors that stood between the decks were four and twenty white mice with chains about their necks there were comfits in the cabin and apples in the hold the sails were made of silk and the masts were made of gold the captain was a duck with a packet on his back and when the ship began to move the captain said quack quack end of section seven recording by ginger cuckolo Section 8 of In the Nursery of My Book House. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ginger Cucolo. In the Nursery of My Book House. Edited by Olive Bupre Miller. Nursery Rhymes, Part 4. Peter, Peter, Pumpkin Eater, had a wife and couldn't keep her. He put her in a pumpkin shell, and there he kept her very well. Pussy sits behind the log. How can she be fair? Then comes in the little dog. Pussy, are you there? So, so, dear mistress Pussy, pray tell me how do you do? I thank you, little doggie. I fare as well as you. A robin and a robin's son once went to town to buy a bun. They couldn't decide on plum or plain, and so they went back home again. 
What's the news of the day, good neighbor, I pray? They say the balloon has gone up to the moon. I had a little nut tree, and nothing would it bear, save a silver nutmeg and a golden pear. The king of Spain's daughter came to visit me, and all was because of my little nut tree. I skipped over water, I danced over sea, and all the birds in the air couldn't catch me. Diddle, diddle, dumpling, my son John went to bed with his trousers on. One shoe off, and the other shoe on. Diddle, diddle, dumpling, my son John. As little Jenny Wren was sitting by the shed, she waggled with her tail and nodded with her head. As little Jenny Wren was sitting by the shed. I'll tell you a story about Mother Maury. And now my story's begun. I'll tell you another of Jack and his brother. And now my story's done. Little girl, little girl, where have you been? Gathering roses to give to the queen? Little girl, little girl, what gave she you? She gave me a diamond as big as my shoe. Rub-a-dub-dub, three men in a tub, and who do you think was there? The butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, and all of them gone to the fair. Little Jack Horner sat in the corner, eating his Christmas pie. He put in his thumb and pulled out a plum and said, What a great boy am I! Bat, bat, come under my hat, and I'll give you a slice of bacon. And when I bake, I'll give you a cake, if I am not mistaken. Willie boy, Willie boy, where are you going? Oh, let us go with you this sunshiny day. I'm going to the meadow to see them a-mowing. I'm going to help the girls turn the new hay. Hector Protector was dressed all in green. Hector Protector was sent to the queen. The queen did not like him, no more did the king. So Hector Protector was sent back again. Boys and girls, come out to play. The moon does shine as bright as day. Come with a whoop, come with a call. Come with a good will, or don't you come at all. Up with the ladder and down the wall, a halfpenny roll will serve us all. You find milk and I'll find flour, and we'll have a pudding in less than an hour. Four and twenty tailors went to catch a snail. The best man amongst them durst not touch her tail. She put out her horns like a little kylo cow. Run, tailors, run, or she'll butt you all just now. Jack, be nimble. Jack, be quick. Jack, jump over the candlestick. End of Section 8 Recording by Ginger Cucolo Section 9 of In the Nursery of My Book House this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Carrie Ray Clark. In the Nursery of My Buck House. Edited by Olive Beaupre Miller. Old Mother Hubbard. Old Mother Hubbard went to the cupboard to give her poor doggie a bone. But when she got there, the cupboard was bare and so the poor doggie had none. She went to the baker's to buy him some bread, and when she came back, the dog stood on his head. She went to the hatter's to buy him a hat, and when she came back, he was feeding the cat. She went to the tailor's to buy him a coat, and when she came back, he was riding the goat. She went to the barber's to buy him a wig, and when she came back, he was dancing a jig. The dame made a curtsy, the dog made a bow, the dame said, your servant. The dog said, bow wow. End of section 9. Recording by Carrie Ray Clark, United States. Chapter 10 of In the Nursery of My Book House. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ginger Cucolo In the Nursery of My Book House Edited by Olive Bupre Miller 
Nursery Rhymes, Part 5 There was an old woman tossed up in a basket, ninety times as high as the moon, and where she was going I couldn't but ask it, for in her hand she carried a broom. Old woman, old woman, old woman, quoth I, O whither, O whither, O whither so high, to sweep the cobwebs out of the sky, shall I go with you? Ay, by and by. Little Nanny Etticoat, in a white petticoat, and a red rose, the longer she stands, the shorter she grows. The King of France went up the hill, with twenty thousand men. The King of France came down the hill, and ne'er went up again. Bernie B, Bernie B, tell me when your wedding be. If it be tomorrow day, take your wings and fly away. One misty, moisty morning, when cloudy was the weather, I chanced to meet an old man clothed all in leather. He began to compliment, and I began to grin, with how do you do, and how do you do, and how do you do again? The cock's on the housetop blowing his horn, the bull's in the barn a threshing of corn, the maids in the meadows are making of hay, the ducks in the rain are swimming away. There wasn't a woman who lived in a shoe. She had so many children, she didn't know what to do. Simple Simon met a pieman going to the fair. Said Simple Simon to the pieman, Let me taste your ware. Says the pieman to Simple Simon, Show me first your penny. Said Simple Simon to the pieman, Indeed, I have not any. Simple Simon went a-fishing for to catch a whale. All the water he had got was in his mother's pail. I'm glad the sky is painted blue and earth is painted green, with such a lot of nice fresh air all sandwiched in between. There were two blackbirds sitting on a hill, the one named Jack and the other named Jill. Fly away, Jack! Fly away, Jill! Come again, Jack! Come again, Jill! My maid Mary, she minds the dairy, while I go a-hoeing and mowing each morn. Gaily run the reel and the little spinning wheel, whilst I am singing and mowing my corn. See, saw, Marjorie Daw, Jenny shall have a new master. She shall have but a penny a day, because she can't work any faster. Gay go up and gay go down. Gay go up and gay go down to ring the bells of London town. Oranges and lemons, say the bells of St. Clement's. You owe me ten shillings, says the bells of St. Helens. When will you pay me, say the bells of Old Bailey. When I go rich, say the bells of Shoreditch. Pray when will that be, say the bells of Stepney. I am sure I don't know, says the great bell at Bow. Brick bats and tiles, say the bells of St. Giles. Half pence and farthings, say the bells of St. Martin's. Pancakes and fritters, say the bells of St. Peter's. Two sticks and an apple, say the bells of Whitechapel. Pokers and tongs, say the bells of St. John's. Kettles and pans, say the bells of St. Anne's. End of section 10. Recording by Ginger Cucolo. Section 11 of In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ginger Cucolo. In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. Edited by Olive Bupre Miller. Nursery Rhymes, Part 6. How many miles is it to Babylon? Three score miles and ten. Can I get there by candlelight? Yes, and back again. If your heels are nimble and light, you may get there by candlelight. As I was going to St. Ives, I met a man with seven wives. Each wife had seven sacks. Each sack had seven cats. Each cat had seven kits. Kits, cats, sacks, and wives. How many were there going to St. Ives? Oh, the grand old Duke of York, 
he had ten thousand men. He marched them up a great hill, and he marched them down again. And when they were up, they were up. And when they were down, they were down. And when they were neither down nor up, they were neither up nor down. There was an owl lived in an oak, whiskey wasky weedle and all the words he ever spoke were fiddle faddle feedle when daffodils begin to peer with high the doxy over the dale why then comes in the sweet o oh, the year for the springtime reigns in the winter's pale blow wind blow and go mill go that the miller may grind his corn that the baker may take it and into rolls make it and send us some hot in the morn Polly put the kettle on, Polly put the kettle on, Polly put the kettle on, we'll all have tea. Suki take it off again, Suki take it off again, Suki take it off again, they're all gone away. Sing, sing, what shall I sing? The cats run away with the pudding bag string. Do, do, what shall I do? The cat has bitten it quite in two. I saw three ships come sailing by, come sailing by, come sailing by. I saw three ships come sailing by on New Year's Day in the morning. And what do you think was in them then? Was in them then? Was in them then? And what do you think was in them then on New Year's Day in the morning? Three pretty girls were in them then, were in them then, were in them then. Three pretty girls were in them then on new year's day in the morning rain rain go away come again another day little johnny wants to play rain rain go to spain don't come back again there was an old woman lived under a hill and if she's not gone she lives there still pie sat on a pear tree a pie sat on a pear tree a pie sat on a pear tree hi ho hi ho hi ho once so merrily hop she twice so merrily hop she thrice so merrily hop she hi ho hi ho hi ho i had a little husband no bigger than my thumb i put him in a pint pot and there i bid him drum i bought a little handkerchief to wipe his little nose and a pair of little garters to tie his little hose I bought a little horse that galloped up and down. I bridled him and saddled him and sent him out of town. As I was going up Pippin Hill, Pippin Hill was dirty. There I met a pretty lass, and she dropped me a curtsy. If I'd as much money as I could spend, I never would cry, Old chairs to mend, old chairs to mend, Old chairs to men, I never would cry, old chairs to men. If I'd as much money as I could tell, I never would cry, old clothes to sell, old clothes to sell, old clothes to sell, I never would cry, old clothes to sell. Is Master Smith within? Yes, that he is. Can he set a shoe? Ay, Mary, too. Here a nail and there a nail, tick, tack, too. End of section 11. Recording by Ginger Cucolo. Section 12 of In the Nursery of My Book House. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ginger Cucolo. In the Nursery of My Book House, edited by Olive Bupre Miller. Here we go around the mulberry bush. Here we go round the mulberry bush, the mulberry bush, the mulberry bush. Here we go round the mulberry bush on a cold and frosty morning. This is the way we wash our clothes, wash our clothes, wash our clothes. This is the way we wash our clothes on a cold and frosty morning. This is the way we iron our clothes, iron our clothes, iron our clothes. This is the way we iron our clothes on a cold and frosty morning. This is the way we wash our hands, wash our hands, wash our hands. This is the way we wash our hands on a cold and frosty morning. 
This is the way we go to school, go to school, go to school. This is the way we go to school on a cold and frosty morning. End of section 12. Recording by Ginger Cucolo. Section 13 of In the Nursery of My Book House. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ginger Cucolo. In the Nursery of My Book House. Edited by Olive Bupre Miller. Nursery Rhymes, Part 7. When Good King Arthur Ruled This Land. When good King Arthur ruled this land, he was a goodly king. He bought three pecks of barley meal to make a bag pudding. A bag pudding the king did make, and stuffed it well with plums, and in it put great lumps of fat as big as my two thumbs. The king and queen did eat thereof, and noblemen beside, and what they could not eat that night the queen next morning fried. Ba ba black sheep, have you any wool? yes sir yes sir three bags full one for the master one for the dame and one for the little boy that lives in the lane there was a piper had a cow and he had naught to give her he took his pipes and played a tune and bade the cow consider the cow considered very well and gave the piper a penny and bade him play the other tune corn rigs or bonny as I went to Bonner, I met a pig without a wig, upon my word and honor. As Tommy Snooks and Bessie Brooks were walking out one Sunday, says Tommy Snooks to Bessie Brooks, tomorrow will be Monday. The man in the wilderness asked me how many strawberries grew in the sea. I answered him as I thought good, as many red herrings as grow in the wood. My Lady Wind my lady wind went round about the house to find a chink to get her foot in she tried the keyhole in the door she tried the crevice in the floor and drove the chimney soot in billy billy come and play while the sun shines bright as day yes my polly so i will for i love to please you still billy billy have you seen sam and betsy on the green yes my paul i saw them pass skipping o'er the new-mown grass billy billy come along and i will play a pretty song oh then polly i'll make haste not one moment will i waste birds of a feather flock together and so will pigs and swine rats and mice will have their choice and so will i have mine charlie nag ate the pudding and left the bag End of section 13. Recording by Ginger Cucolo. Section 14 of In the Nursery of My Book House. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Aidan Brack. In the Nursery of My Book House, edited by Olive Bupre Miller. Three Jovial Huntsmen There were three jovial Welshmen, as I have heard them say, and they would go a-hunting upon St. David's Day. All the day they hunted, and nothing could they find, but a ship a-sailing, a-sailing with the wind. One said it was a ship, the other he said nay, the third said it was a house, with the chimney blown away. And all the night they hunted, and nothing could they find, but the moon a-gliding, a-gliding with the wind. One said it was the moon, the other he said nay, the third said it was a cheese, and half of it cut away. And all the day they hunted, and nothing could they find, but a hedgehog in a bramble bush, and that they left behind. The first said it was a hedgehog, the second he said nay. The third said twas a pincushion, with the pin stuck in wrong way. 
and all the night they hunted, and nothing could they find but a hare in a turnip field, and that they left behind. The first said it was a hare, the second he said nay, the third said it was a calf, and the cow had run away, and all the day they hunted, and nothing could they find but an owl in a holly tree, and that they left behind. One said it was an owl, the other he said nay. The third said twas an old man, whose beard was growing grey. End of section 14「Section number 15 of In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Candace Stellick. In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. Edited by Olive Bapure Miller. Little Tommy Tucker sang for his supper. What shall we give him? Brown bread and butter. How shall he cut it? Without e'er a knife. How shall he marry without ever a wife? Entery, mentery, cuttery corn. Apple seed and apple thorn. Wire, briar, limber lock. Three geese in a flock. One flew east and one flew west. And one flew over the cuckoo's nest. If wishes were horses, beggars would ride. If turnips were watches, I'd wear one by my side. Buttons, a farthing a pair. Come, who will buy them of me? They're round and sound and pretty, and fit for girls of the city. Come, who will buy them of me? Buttons, a farthing a pair. Merry are the bells, and merry would they ring. Merry was myself, and merry would I sing. With a merry ding-dong, happy, gay, and free, And a merry sing-song, happy let us be. Merry have we met, and merry we have been. Merry let us part, and merry meet again. With our merry sing-song, happy, gay, and free, And a merry ding-dong, happy let us be. March winds and April showers bring forth May flowers. If all the world were water, and all the water ink. What should we do for bread and cheese? What should we do for drink? There was a monkey climbed up a tree. When he fell down, then down fell he. There was a crow sat on a stone. When he was gone, then there was none. There was an old wife did eat an apple. When she ate two, she had eaten a couple. There once was a horse going to the mill. When he went on, he stood not still. There was a navy, went to Spain. When it returned, it came back again. A little cock sparrow sat on a green tree, and he chirruped, he chirruped, so merry was he. A little cock sparrow sat on a green tree, and he chirruped and chirruped, so merry was he. My father left me three acres of land. My father left me three acres of land. Sing ivy, sing ivy. My father left me three acres of land. Sing holly, go whistle and ivy. I plowed it with a crooked ram's horn. Sing ivy, sing ivy. And sowed it over with one peppercorn. Sing holly, go whistle and ivy. I harrowed it with a bramble bush. Sing ivy, sing ivy and reaped it with my little penknife. Sing holly, go whistle, and ivy. I'd mice to carry it into the barn. Sing ivy, sing ivy, and threshed it with a goose quill. Sing holly, go whistle, and ivy. If all the seas were one sea, what a great sea that would be. And if all of the trees were one tree, what a great tree that would be. And if all of the axes were one axe, what a great axe that would be. And if all the men were one man, what a great man that would be.
and if the great man took the great axe and cut down the great tree and let it fall into the great sea what a splish splash that would be sunshine hickamore hackamore on the king's kitchen door all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't drive hickamore hackamore off the king's kitchen door peter piper picked a peck of pickled peppers a peck of pickled peppers peter piper picked if peter piper picked a peck of pickled peppers where's the peck of pickled peppers peter piper picked i went up one pair of stairs just like me i went up two pair of stairs just like me i went into a room just like me i looked out a window just like me and there i saw a monkey just like me great a little a bouncing b the cat's in the cupboard and can't see me a diller a dollar a ten o'clock scholar what makes you come so soon you used to come at ten o'clock but now you come at noon there's a little neat clock in the schoolroom it stands and it points to the time with its two little hands and may we like the clock Keep a face clean and bright, with hands ever ready to do what is right. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, and T, U, V, W, X, Y, and Z. Now I've said my A, B, C. Tell me what you think of me. One, two, buckle my shoe. Three, four, knock at the door. Five, six, pick up sticks. Seven, eight, lay them straight. Nine, ten, a big fat hen. Eleven, twelve, dig and delve. Hey diddle, dinkity, poppity pet. The merchants of London, they wear scarlet. Silk in the collar and gold in the hem. So merrily march merchant men mind your commas every lady in the land has twenty nails upon each hand five and twenty on hands and feet all this is true without deceit posies from kate greenway going to see grandma little molly and damon are walking so far for they're going to see their kind grandmama and they very well know when they get there she'll take from out of her cupboard some very nice cake and into her garden they know they may run and pick some red currants and have lots of fun so damon to doggy says how do you do and asks his mamma if he may not go to the tea party in the pleasant green garden we sat down to tea do you take sugar and do you take milk she got a new gown on a smart one of silk we all were as happy as happy could be on that bright summer's day when she asked us to tea little wind little wind blow on the hilltop little wind blow down the plain little wind blow up the sunshine little wind blow off the rain end of section 15 recording by candace stellick dallas texas Section 16 of In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In the Nursery of My Bookhouse, edited by Olive Beaupre Miller. The Little Red Hen and the Grain of Wheat, an English Folk Tale. The Little Red Hen was in the farmyard with her chicks looking for something to eat she found some grains of wheat and she said cut 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 a cut these grains of wheat all sow the rain and warm spring sunshine will surely make them grow now who will help me sow the wheat not i said the duck not i said the mouse not i said the pig then i'll sow it myself said the little red hen and she did when the grain had grown up tall and was ready to cut, 
the little red hen said. Cut, 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 cut a cut. I'll cut, cut, cut this grain. It's nodding ripe and golden from days of sun and rain. Now who will help me cut the wheat? Not I, said the duck. Not I, said the mouse. Not I, said the pig. Then I'll cut it myself, said the little red hen. And she did. When the wheat was cut, the little red hen said, Cut, 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 cut a cut. It's time to thresh the wheat. Each little grain so precious, from out the chaff I'll beat. Now who will help me thresh the wheat? Not I, said the duck. Not I, said the mouse. Not I, said the pig. Then I'll thresh it myself, said the little red hen. And she did. When the wheat was threshed, the little red hen said, See where the windmill's great long arms go whirling round and round? I'll take this grain straight to the mill, to flour it shall be ground. Cluck, cluck, who'll help me carry the grain to the mill? Not I, said the duck. Not I, said the mouse. Not I, said the pig. Then I'll carry it myself, said the little red hen. And she did. When the wheat was ground, the little red hen said, I've sowed and reaped and threshed, cluck, cluck. I've carried to the mill, and now I'll bake a loaf of bread with greatest care and skill. Who'll help me bake the bread? Not I, said the duck. Not I, said the mouse. Not I, said the pig. Then I'll bake it myself, said the little red hen. And she did. When the bread was baked, the little red hen said, Cluck, 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 cluck. The bread is done. It's light and sweet. Now who will come and help me eat? I will, quacked the duck. I will, squeaked the mouse. I will, grunted the pig. No, you won't, said the little red hen. I'll do it myself. Cluck, cluck, my chicks. I earned this bread for you. Eat it up, eat it up. And they did. End of section 16. Recorded by Patty Cunningham. Section 17 of In the Nursery of My Book House. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In the Nursery of My Book House. Edited by Olive Bopri Miller. Over in the Meadow by Olive A. Wadsworth Over in the meadow, in the sand, in the sun, lived an old mother toad, and her little toady one. Wink, said the mother. I wink, said the one. So she winked and she blinked, in the sand, in the sun. Over in the meadow, where the stream runs blue, lived an old mother fish, and her little fishes too. Swim, said the mother. We swim, said the two. So they swam and they leaped, where the stream runs blue. Over in the meadow, in a hole in a tree, lived an old mother bluebird, and her little birdies three. Sing, said the mother. We sing, said the three. So they sang and were glad, in the hole in the tree. Over in the meadow, in the reeds on the shore, lived a mother muskrat, and her little ratties four. Dive, said the mother. We dive, said the four. So they dived and they burrowed in the reeds on the shore. Over in the meadow, in a snug beehive, lived a mother honeybee and her little bees five. Buzz, said the mother. We buzz, said the five. So they buzzed and they hummed in the snug beehive. Over in the meadow, in a nest built of sticks, lived a black mother crow and her little crows six. Caw, said the mother. We caw, said the six. So they cawed and they called in their nest built of sticks. Over in the meadow, where the grass is so even, lived a gay mother cricket and her little cricket seven. Chirp, said the mother. We chirp, said the seven. So they chirped cheery notes in the grass, soft and even. Over in the meadow, by the old mossy gate, lived a brown mother lizard and her little lizards eight. Bask, said the mother. We bask, said the eight. So they basked in the sun on the old mossy gate. 
Over in the meadow where the quiet pools shine lived a green mother frog and her little froggies nine. Croak, said the mother. We croak, said the nine. So they croaked and they splashed where the quiet pools shine. Over in the meadow, in a sly little den, lived a grey mother spider and her little spider's ten. Spin, said the mother. We spin, said the ten. So they spun lace webs in their sly little den. End of section 17. Read by Kara Schallenberg. www.kray.org in May 2012 in San Diego, California. Section 18 of In the Nursery of My Book House. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ginger Cucolo. In the Nursery of My Book House. Edited by Olive Bupre Miller. Moon So Round and Yellow. By Matthias Barr. Moon So Round and Yellow looking from on high how i love to see you shining in the sky oft and oft i wonder when i see you there how they get to light you hanging in the air where you go at morning when the night is past and the sun comes peeping o'er the hills at last sometime i will watch you slyly overhead when you think i'm sleeping snugly in my bed End of section 18. Recording by Ginger Cucolo. Section 19 of In the Nursery of My Book House. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ginger Cucolo. In the Nursery of My Book House. Edited by Olive Bupre Miller What the Moon Saw by Hans Christian Andersen Listen to what old Mr. Moon told me. I have seen many happy people as I travel about, said the moon, but I have never seen greater joy than I saw last night. I peeped in a window, and there stood a child, a little four-year-old girl. She had on a very pretty new dress and a pink hat, they had just been put on, and the people who stood about were calling for lights. My own light, as it shone through the window, was not strong enough for them to see her. They must have something brighter altogether to look at anything so pretty. When the candles came and were all ablaze, there stood the little girl as stiff as any doll. She was holding her arms away from the dress so as not to touch it, and each finger stuck out straight and stiff. Oh, how her eyes shone, and her whole face beamed with gladness. Tomorrow you shall go out in your new clothes, said the mother, and the little one looked down at her frock and smiled so happily. Mother, she said, what do you suppose the dogs will think when they see me in all my pretty things? End of section 19 Recording by Ginger Cucolo Section number 20 of In the Nursery of My Book House This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Candace Stellick In the Nursery of My Book House Edited by Olive Bupure Miller The Wake-Up Story by Adora Thumstead The sun was up and the breeze was blowing and the five chicks and the four geese and the three rabbits and the two kitties and one little dog were just as noisy and lively as they knew how to be. They were all watching for Baby Ray to appear at the window, but he was still fast asleep in his little white bed while Mama was making ready the things he would need when he should wake up. 
First she went along to the orchard path as far as the old wooden pump and said, Good pump, will you give me some nice clear water for the baby's bath? And the pump was willing. The good old pump by the orchard path gave nice clear water for the baby's bath. Then she went a little farther on the path and stopped at the woodpile and said, Good Chips, the pump has given me nice clear water for dear little Ray. Will you come and warm the water and cook his food? And the chips were willing. The good old pump by the orchard path gave nice clear water for baby's bath. And the clean white chips from the pile of wood were glad to warm it and cook his food. So Mama went on till she came to the barn, and then said, Good cow, the pump has given me nice clear water, and the woodpile has given me clean white chips for dear little Ray. Will you give me warm, rich milk? And the cow was willing. Then she said to the top knot hen, who was scratching in the straw, Good Biddy, the pump has given me nice clear water, and the woodpile has given me clean white chips, and the cow has given me warm, rich milk for dear little Ray. Will you give me a new laid egg? And the hen was willing. The good old pump by the orchard path gave nice clear water for baby's bath. The clean white chips from the pile of wood were glad to warm it and cook his food. The cow gave milk and the milk pail bright, and the top knot biddy an egg new and white. Then Mama went on till she came to the orchard and said to a red June apple tree, Good tree, the pump has given me nice clear water, and the wood pile has given me clean white chips, and the cow has given me warm rich milk, and the hen has given me a new laid egg for dear little Ray. Will you give me a pretty red apple? And the tree was willing. So Mama took the apple and the egg and the milk and the chips and the water to the house, and there was baby Ray in his nightgown, looking out of the window. And she kissed him, and bathed him, and dressed him, and while she brushed and curled his soft brown hair, she told him the wake-up story that I am telling you. The good old pump by the orchard path gave nice clear water for baby's bath. The clean white chips from the pile of wood were glad to warm it and cook his food. The cow gave milk in the milk pail bright, the top knot biddy an egg new and white, and the tree gave an apple so round and so red for dear little Ray, who was just out of bed. End of section 20. Recording by Candace Stellick, Dallas, Texas. Section 21 of In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jill Janovitz. In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. Edited by Olive Belpre Miller. Going to London by Mary Mapes Dodge. Up, down, up, down, all the way to London Town, sunny road and shady. I'm the papa, you're the mama, you're the pretty lady. Up, down, up, down, all the way to London Town. See how fast we're going? Feel the jar of the car, feel the wind a blowing. Up, down, up, down, all the way to London Town. Here we are this minute, rock a chair anywhere when we two are in it. End of section 21. Section 22 of In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Jill Janovitz. In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. Edited by Olive Beaupre Miller. Precocious Piggy by Thomas Hood. Where are you going to, you little pig? I'm leaving my mother. I'm growing so big. So big, young pig. So young, so big. What? Leaving your mother? You foolish young pig. Where are you going to, you little pig? I've got a new spade, and I'm going to dig. To dig, little pig? A little pig dig? Well, I never saw a pig with a spade that could dig. Where are you going to, you little pig? Why, I'm going to have a nice ride in a jig. In a jig, little pig. What? A pig in a jig? Well, I never saw a pig ride in a jig. Where are you going to, you little pig? Well, I'm going to the ball to dance a fine jig. A jig, little pig? A pig dance a jig? Well, I never before saw a pig dance a jig. Where are you going to, you little pig? I'm going to the fair to run a fine rig. A rig, little pig. A pig run a rig? Well, I never before saw a pig run a rig. Where are you going to, you little pig? I'm going to the barber's to buy me a wig. A wig, little pig. A pig in a wig? Why, whoever before saw a pig in a wig? End of section 22. Section 23 of In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Max Basto. In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. Edited by Olive Beaupre Miller. The Cat and the Mouse, an English folk tale. The cat and the mouse played in the malt house. The cat bit the mouse's tail off. Pray, puss, cried the mouse, give me my tail. No, no, says the cat, I'll not give you your tail till you go to the cow and fetch me some milk. First she leaped and then she ran, till she came to the cow and thus she began. Pray, cow, give me some milk that I may give cat milk that cat may give me my tail again. No, no, said the cow, I'll give you no milk till you go to farmer and get me some hay. First she leaped and then she ran, till she came to farmer and thus she began. Pray, farmer, give me some hay, that I may give cow hay, that cow may give me milk, that I may give cat milk, that cat may give me my tail again. No, no, said the farmer, I'll give you no hay till you go to the butcher and fetch me some meat. First she leaped and then she ran till she came to the butcher, and thus she began. Pray, butcher, give me meat, that I may give farmer meat, that farmer may give me hay, that I may give cow hay, that cow may give me milk, that I may give cat's milk, that cat may give me my tail again. No, said the butcher, I'll give you no meat till you go to the baker and fetch me some bread. First she leaped, and then she ran, till she came to the baker, and thus she began. Pray, baker, give me bread, that I may give butcher bread, that butcher may give me meat, that I may give farmer meat, that farmer may give me hay, that I may give cow hay, that cow may give me milk, that I may give cat's milk, that cat may give me my tail again. Yes, said the baker, I'll give you some bread, but don't eat my meal or I'll cut off your head. Then the baker gave mouse bread, and mouse gave butcher bread, and butcher gave mouse meat, and mouse gave farmer meat, and farmer gave mouse hay, and mouse gave cow hay, and cow gave mouse milk, and mouse gave cat milk, and cat gave mouse her tail again. End of section 23. Recording by Max Busto. Section 24 of In the Nursery of My Bookhouse Johnny and the Three Goats, A Norse Tale This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Now you shall hear. 
Once there was a boy named Johnny, and he had three goats. All day long those goats leaped and pranced and skipped and climbed way on the top of the hill, but every night Johnny went to fetch them and drove them home. One evening, the frisky things leaped out of the road and over a fence and into a turnip field. And, try as he would, Johnny could not get them to come out again. There they were, and there they stayed. Then the boy sat down on the hillside and cried and cried and cried. As he sat there, a hare came along. Why do you cry? asked the hare. I cry because I can't get the goats out of the turnip field, answered Johnny. I'll get the goats out of the turnip field, said the hare. So he tried and tried, but the goats would not come. So then the hare sat down beside Johnny and began to cry too. Along came a fox. Why do you cry? asked the fox. I cry because the boy cries, said the hare, and the boy cries because he cannot get the goats out of the turnip field. I'll get the goats out of the turnip field, said the fox. So the fox tried and he tried and he tried, but the goats would not come. So then the fox sat down beside Johnny and the hare and began to cry too. Pretty soon along came a wolf. Why do you cry? asked the wolf. I cry because the hare cries, said the fox, and the hare cries because the boy cries, and the boy cries because he can't get the goats out of the turnip field. I'll get the goats out of the turnip field, said the wolf. So he tried and he tried and he tried and he tried, but the goats would not leave the field. So the wolf sat down beside Johnny and the hare and the fox and began to cry too. After a little, a bee flew over the hill and saw them all sitting there crying away for dear life. Boo-hoo, boo-hoo, boo-hoo. Why do you cry? said the bee to the wolf. I cry because the fox cries, and the fox cries because the hare cries, and the hare cries because the boy cries, and the boy cries because he can't get the goats out of the turnip field. Much good it does to sit there and cry about it, said the bee. I'll get the goats out of the turnip field. Then the great big wolf and the great big fox and the great big hare and the great big boy all stopped boohooing for a moment to poke fun at the tiny bee. You get the goats out of the turnip field, indeed, when we could not. Ho, ho, ha, 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 ridiculous little creature. But the tiny bee flew away into the turnip field and let square in the ear of one of the goats. And all he did was say, buzz, 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 and out ran the goats, every one. End of section 24. Section 25 of In the Nursery of My Book House. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Verity Kendall. In the Nursery of My Book House. Edited by Olive Bupro Miller. The Clucking Hen. Will you take a walk with me, my little wife, today? There's barley in the barley field and hay seed in the hay. Thank you, said the clucking hen. I've something else to do. I'm busy sitting on my eggs. I cannot walk with you. The clucking hen sat on her nest. She made it on the hay. And warm and snug beneath her breast a dozen white eggs lay. Crack, crack went all the eggs. Out dropped the chickens small. Cluck, said the clucking hen. Now I have you all. Come along, my little chicks, I'll take a walk with you. Hello, said the barn door cock, cock a doodle do. End of section twenty five. Recording by Verity Kendall. Section twenty six of In the Nursery of My Book House. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ginger Cucolo. In the Nursery of My Book House. Edited by Olive Bupre Miller. Belling the Cat. Adapted from Aesop. Long ago, the mice all came together to talk over what they could do to keep themselves safe from the cat. They sat around in a great circle under an old wash tub with a candle for light and wiggled their whiskers, and blinked their eyes, and looked very wise indeed. Some said, Let us do this, and others said, Let us do that. But at last a young mouse got up, 
proudly swished his tail, and looked about as though to say he knew more than all the rest of them put together. I have thought of something, said he, that will be sure to keep us safe from the cat. Tell us what it is, then, squeaked the other mice. You all know, said the young mouse. It is because Pussy creeps up on us so very quietly that she is right upon us before we see her. If we could only plan something which would let us know when she is coming, then we should always have plenty of time to scamper out of her way. Now I say, let us get a small bell and tie it by a ribbon around her neck. Then she will not be able to move it at all without jingling the bell. So when we hear the bell tinkle, we shall always know that she is about and can easily keep out of her reach. As the young mouse sat down, very proud of himself, all the others clapped their paws and squeaked. Just the thing, just the thing. Big Whiskers has told us what we should do. They even began talking about whether they should get a silver bell or a brass one, and whether they should use a blue ribbon or a pink one. But at last an old mouse got slowly up from his seat and said, It is all very well what Big Whiskers has said. What he has thought of would truly be wise. But who is going to put the bell on the cat? The mice looked at one another. Nobody spoke a word. Who indeed would dare go straight up to Pussy and tie the bell about her neck? The old mouse looked straight at Big Whiskers. But Big Whiskers was proud no more. He made himself as small as he could, for he had never, never thought to do such a thing himself. Then the old mouse said, It is all very well to talk about doing great things, but all that really counts is to do them. End of section 26. Recording by Ginger Kukulo. Section 27 of In the Nursery of My Book House. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Donna Winters. In the Nursery of My Book House. Edited by Olive Bupre Miller. Story by Mary Mapes Dodge. What they say. What does the drum say? Rub a dab dab. Rub a dab rub a dab. Pound away bab. Make as much racket as ever you can. Rub a dab rub a dab. Got it, my man? What does the trumpet say? To the two two. To the two to the two. Hurrah for you. Blow in the censer and hold me out so. To the two to the two. Why don't you blow? What does the whip say? Snapperty snap. Call that a crack, sir. Flipperty flap. Up with the handle and down with the lash. Snapperty snapperty down in a flash. End of section 27. Recording by Donna Winters. Section 28 of In the Nursery of My Book House. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Eaton. In the Nursery of My Book House. Edited by Olive Beaupre Miller. The Little Big Man by Rabindranath Tagore. I am small because I am a little child. I shall be big when I am old as my father is. My teacher will come and say, it is late. Bring your slate and your books. I shall tell him, do you not know I am as big as father and I must not have lessons any more. My master will wonder and say, he can leave his books if he likes, for he is grown up. I shall dress myself and walk to the fair where the crowd is thick. My uncle will come rushing up to me and say, you will get lost, my boy, let me carry you. I shall answer, can't you see, uncle? I am as big as father, I must go to the fair alone. Uncle will say, yes, he can go wherever he likes, for he is grown up. Mother will come from her bath when I am giving money to my nurse, for I shall know how to open the box with my key. Mother will say, What are you about, naughty child? I shall tell her, Mother, don't you know, I am as big as father, and I must give silver to my nurse. Mother will say to herself, He can give money to whom he likes, for he is grown up. In the holiday time in October, Father will come home, and thinking that I am still a baby, will bring for me from the town little shoes and small silken frocks. I shall say, Father, give them to my dada, for I am as big as you are. 
father will think and say he can buy his own clothes if he likes for he is grown up end of section 28section 29 of in the nursery of my bookhouse this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org in the nursery of my bookhouse edited by olive beaupre miller the farmer's boy the farmer's boy when i was a farmer a farmer's boy i used to keep my master's horses with a gee wo here and a gee wo there, here a gee and there a gee, everywhere a gee wo. When I was a farmer, a farmer's boy, I used to keep my master's cows. With a moo moo here and a moo moo there, here a moo, there a moo, and everywhere a moo moo. When I was a farmer, a farmer's boy, I used to keep my master's chickens. With a cluck cluck here and a cluck cluck there, here a cluck, there a cluck, and everywhere a cluck cluck. When I was a farmer, a farmer's boy, I used to keep my master's dogs, with a bow-wow here, and a bow-wow there, here a bow, there a wow, and everywhere a bow-wow. When I was a farmer, a farmer's boy, I used to keep my master's ducks, with a quack-quack here, and a quack-quack there, here a quack, and there a quack, and everywhere a quack-quack. When I was a farmer, a farmer's boy, I used to keep my master's turkeys, with a gobble gobble here and a gobble gobble there here a gobble there a gobble everywhere a gobble gobble when i was a farmer a farmer's boy i used to keep my master's lambs with a ba ba here and a ba ba there here a ba and there a ba and everywhere a ba ba when i was a farmer a farmer's boy i used to keep my master's pigs with a grunt grunt here and a grunt grunt there here a grunt and there a grunt and everywhere a grunt grunt end of section 29 recording by kung fu fighters section 30 of in the nursery of my bookhouse this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org in the nursery of my bookhouse edited by olive beaupre miller the little gray pony by maud lindsay there once was a man who owned a little gray pony every morning when the dewdrops were still hanging on the pink clover in the meadows and the birds were singing their morning song the man would jump on his pony and ride away clippity clippity clop the pony's four small hooves played the jolliest tune on the smooth pike road the pony's head was always high in the air and the pony's two little ears were always pricked up for he was a merry gray pony and loved to go clippity clippity clap the man rode to town and to country to church and to market up hill and down hill and one day he heard something fall with a clang on a stone in the road. Looking back, he saw a horseshoe lying there, and when he saw it, he cried out, What shall I do? What shall I do if my little gray pony has lost a shoe? Then down he jumped in a great hurry, and looked at one of the pony's forefeet, but nothing was wrong. He lifted the other forefoot, but the shoe was still there. He examined one of the hind feet and began to think that he was mistaken. But when he looked at the last foot, he cried again, What shall I do? What shall I do? My little gray pony has lost a shoe. Then he made haste to go to the blacksmith, and when he saw the smith, he called out to him, Blacksmith, blacksmith, I've come to you. My little gray pony has lost a shoe. But the blacksmith answered and said, How can I shoe your pony's feet without some coal the iron to heat? The man was downcast when he heard this, but he left his little gray pony in the blacksmith's care while he hurried here and there to buy the coal. First of all he went to the store, and when he got there he said, Storekeeper, storekeeper, I've come to you. My little gray pony has lost a shoe. 
and I want some coal the iron to heat that the blacksmith may shoe my pony's feet. But the storekeeper answered and said, Now I have apples and candy to sell, and more nice things than I can tell, but I've no coal the iron to heat that the blacksmith may shoe your pony's feet. Then the man went away sighing and saying, What shall I do? What shall I do? My little gray pony has lost a shoe. By and by he met a farmer coming to town with a wagon full of good things, and he said, Farmer, farmer, I've come to you. My little gray pony has lost a shoe, and I want some coal the iron to heat that the blacksmith may shoe my pony's feet. Then the farmer answered the man and said, I've bushels of corn and hay and wheat, something for you and your pony to eat, but I've no coal the iron to heat that the blacksmith may shoe your pony's feet. So the farmer drove away and left the man standing in the road, sighing and saying, What shall I do? What shall I do? My little gray pony has lost a shoe. In the farmer's wagon, full of good things, he saw corn, which made him think of the mill. So he hastened there and called to the dusty miller, 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 I've come to you. My little gray pony has lost a shoe, and I want some coal the iron to heat that the blacksmith may shoe my pony's feet. The miller came to the door in surprise, and when he heard what was needed, he said, I have wheels that go round and round, and stones to turn till the grain is ground, but I've no coal the iron to heat that the blacksmith may shoe your pony's feet. Then the man turned away sorrowfully, and sat down on a rock near the roadside, sighing and saying, What shall I do? What shall I do? My little gray pony has lost a shoe. After a while a very old woman came down the road driving a flock of geese to market, and when she came near the man she stopped to ask him his trouble. He told her all about it, and when she had heard it all, she laughed till her geese joined in with a cackle, and she said, If you would know where the coal is found, you must go to the miner who works in the ground. Then the man sprang to his feet, and thanking the old woman, he ran to the miner. Now the miner had been working many a long day down in the mine under the ground, where it was so dark that he had to wear a lamp on the front of his cap to light him at his work. He had plenty of black coal ready, and gave great lumps of it to the man, who took them in haste to the blacksmith. The blacksmith lighted his great red fire, and hammered out four fine new shoes with a cling and a clang, and fastened them on with a rap and a tap. Then away rode the man on his little gray pony, clippity-clippity-clap. Yankee Doodle went to town upon a little pony, he stuck a feather in his hat and called it macaroni. End of section thirty. Recording by Patty Cunningham. Section thirty one of In the Nursery of My Book House. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In the Nursery of My Book House, edited by Olive Bobry Miller. The Key of the Kingdom This is the key of the kingdom. In the kingdom there is a city. In that city there is a town. In that town there is a street. In that street there is a lane. In that lane there is a yard. In that yard there is a house. In that house there is a room. In that room there is a bed. On that bed there is a basket. In the basket there are some flowers. Flowers in the basket, basket on the bed, bed in the room, room in the house, house in the yard, yard in the lane, lane in the street, street in the town, town in the city, city in the kingdom, and this is the key to the kingdom. End of The Key of the Kingdom Recording by Ellie in May 2012
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rebecca, www.bluebird-experience.com. In the Nursery of My Book House, edited by Olive Beaupre Miller. The Daring Prince by James Whitcomb Riley. A daring prince of the realm Rangdoon once went up in a big balloon that caught and stuck on the horns of the moon, and he hung up there until next day noon, when all at once he exclaimed, Hoot toot! and then came down in his parachute. End of section 32. Recording by Rebecca. Section 33 of In the Nursery of My Book House. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. What Else the Moon Saw by Hans Christian Andersen. Mr. Moon told me many things that he had seen as he traveled around the world. Once he said, The master of a dancing bear tied his great shaggy beast to a tree while he ate his supper. In an upper room of the inn where the man was eating, three little children played. I looked in at the window and saw them. They were romping and laughing, when all of a sudden, tramp, 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 was heard on the stairs, tramp, tramp, and the clanking of chains. Who could it be? The children stood still and listened. In a moment the door flew open, and lo and behold, there stood the bear, a huge shaggy bear, with his chain dragging along on the floor behind him. Tired of standing alone so long in the yard, he had broken away from the tree and found his way up the staircase of the inn. At first the children cried out in alarm, and when they saw him, ran into a corner to hide. But the bear found them all, and snuffling, put his muscle up to them, but did not harm them in the least. He must be a big dog, thought the children, and they began to pet and stroke him. The bear lay down and stretched himself out on the floor. The youngest boy rolled over him and nestled his curly head in his shaggy black fur. Then the oldest boy ran to get his drum and began to thump away on it with all his might. Rub-a-dub, rub a dub rub a dub At that the bear stood up on his hind legs and began to dance. What fun! Each boy shouldered his gun, and they gave the bear a gun too, and he held it tight and straight as any soldier. There was a playmate for them, and they marched all around the room. One, two, one, two, one, two. All at once the door opened, and there stood the children's mother. You should have seen her face when she saw her children playing with a bear. But the youngest boy laughed with joy and cried, Mama, we are all playing soldier. Just at that moment the man came in and took his bear away. End of What Else the Moon Saw Recording by Ellie in May 2012
said the fox, chuckling to himself, that you do not like the soup. Oh, pray you do not say anything about it, said the stork. I hope you will return this visit and come soon to eat dinner with me. So a day was set when the fox should visit the stork. But when they were seated at the table, all that the stork had made ready for dinner was held in a very slim, long-necked jar with a narrow mouth. Down into this, the stork could easily reach her slender bill, but the fox could not get his thick snout into it, so all he could manage to do was lick the outside of the jar. I will not say I am sorry you have eaten so little, said the stork, for as you treat others, you must also expect others to treat you. There was an old man with a beard who said, It is just as I fear, two owls and a hen, four larks and a wren, have built their nests in my beard. Edward Lear. End of section 35. Section 36 of In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Chenevere. In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. Edited by Olive Beaupre Miller. There was an old man with a beard by Edward Lear. There was an old man with a beard who said, It is just as I feared. Two owls and a hen, four larks and a wren, have all built their nests in my beard. End of section 36 Section 37 of In the Nursery of My Book House This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Capricia Page. In the Nursery of My Book House. Edited by Olive Beaupre Miller. Clouds. White sheep, white sheep, on a blue hill. When the wind stops, you all stand still. When the wind blows, you walk away slow. White sheep, white sheep, where do you go? End of section 37. Recording by Capricia Page. Section 38 of In the Nursery of My Book House. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Clouds and Waves by Rabindranath Tagore Mother, the fog who live up in the clouds, call out to me. We play from the time we wake till the day ends. We play with the golden dawn. We play with the silver moon. I ask, but how am I to get up to you? The answer, come to the edge of the earth. Lift up your hands to the sky, and you will be taken up into the clouds. My mother is waiting for me at home, I say. How can I leave her and come? Then they smile and float away. But I know a nicer game than that, mother. I shall be the cloud and you the moon. I shall cover you with both hands, and our house top will be the blue sky. The folk who live in the waves call out to me. We sing from morning till night, on and on we travel, and know not where we pass. I ask, but how am I to join you? They tell me, come to the edge of the shore and stand with your eyes tight shut, and you will be carried out upon the waves. I say, my mother always wants me at home in the evening. How can I leave her and go? Then they smile and dance and pass by. But I know a better game than that. I will be the waves, and you will be a strange shore. I shall roll on and on and on and break upon your lap with laughter and no one in the world will know where we both are. End of section 38 Recording by Ellie in May 2012 Section 39 of In the Nursery of My Book House 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Chenevere. In the Nursery of My Book House, edited by Oliver Beaupre Miller. Who Likes the Rain? by Clara Dotty Bates. I, said the duck, I call it fun, for I have my little rubbers on. They make a cunning three-toed track in the soft, cool mud. Quack, quack. I, cried the dandelion, I, my roots are thirsty, my buds are dry. And she lifted a tousled yellow head out of her green and grassy bed. I hope twill pour, I hope twill pour, purred the tree-toad at his gray back door. For with a broad leaf for a roof, I am perfectly weatherproof. I shouted Ted, for I can run with my high-top boots and my raincoat on through every puddle and runlet and pool that I find on my way to school. End of Who Likes the Rain? Section forty of In the Nursery of My Book House. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Zinfried. In the Nursery of My Book House. Edited by Olive Beaupre Miller. The Donkey and the Lapdog. Adapted from Aesop. A farmer one day went to his stable to see the beasts that were there. Among these was his favorite donkey. He was a big, shaggy, gray animal, always well fed and cared for, and every day the farmer rode upon his back. The farmer looked about to see that all in the stable was as it should be. Now with him had come his little white lapdog, a teeny tiny fluff of a creature, who danced and frisked about and licked his master's hand. The farmer watched his dainty frolic with a smile on his lips. Then he sat down and gave the lapdog a piece of sugar. When he had finished eating the sweetmeat, the teeny tiny fluff of a creature jumped into his master's lap and lay there, curled up and blinking, while the farmer patted him and stroked his ears. The donkey, seeing how his master patted the lapdog for his dainty ways, suddenly thought to get himself stroked and patted in the same way. So he broke loose from his halter and commenced dancing and prancing about just as the lapdog had done. The farmer held his sides with laughter. There the great, big, clumsy beast went capering about, standing up on his hind legs, waving his hoofs absurdly, and cocking his great shaggy head foolishly on one side. At last he went up to his master, put his hoof on the farmer's shoulder, and tried to climb up into the little dog's place in his lap. But at that the farmer's servants rushed up and drove the donkey away for they had to teach him that if he wanted people to love him, he must be himself and not try to act like someone else. End of section 40 Section 41 of In the Nursery of My Book House This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matteo Palferman In the Nursery of My Bookhouse Edited by Olive Bupre Miller The Two Crabs Adapted from Aesop One fine sunny day, two crabs came out from their home in the deep blue sea to take a walk on the yellow sand. There was one big crab and one little crab. Child! said the big crab, turning his eyes this way and that to see who was looking at them. You are walking very awkwardly, twisting all the time from side to side. I don't like to be seen out walking with you. I wish you would learn to go straight forward and stop waddling. The little crab looked at the big crab to learn from him just what was the right way to walk. There he saw the big crab making his way proudly along between speckled green lobsters, bright-colored starfish, and all the other little sea creatures that stood in a row to watch them. But lo and behold, the big crab himself was going waddle, waddle, twist and hitch, waddle, waddle, twist and hitch. Well, 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 said the little crab. If you want me to stop waddling, 
You will have to show me how by first walking straight forward yourself. The best way to teach others how to do what is right is to do right yourself. End of section 41. Section 42 of In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Chenevere. In the Nursery of My Bookhouse, edited by Olive Beaupre Miller. Sir Robin by Lucy Larkham. Rollicking Robin is here again. What does he care for the April rain? Care for it? Glad of it. Doesn't he know that the April rain carries off the snow, and coaxes out leaves to shadow his nest, and washes his pretty red Easter vest, and makes the juice of the cherry sweet for his hungry little robins to eat? Ha, ha, ha! Hear the jolly bird laugh. That isn't the best of the story by half. End of section 42 Section 43 of In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ginger Cucolo. In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. Edited by Olive Bupre Miller. The Tale of a Black Cat, an American Folk Tale. Once there was a little boy named Tommy and there's a T that stands for Tommy. Tommy's house was not a very good one, so he built a new wall on this side of it, and then he built a new wall on that side of it. You can see now that he had two nice rooms in his house, though not very large. Next he put in windows to look out of, one in this room and one in that room. Then he made a tall chimney on this side of his house and then he made a tall chimney on the other side of his house. After that he started some grass beside his door, like this. Not very far away from Tommy's house lived a little girl named Sally, and there's an S that stands for Sally. When Tommy had finished his house, he thought he would like to go and tell Sally what he had been doing, so he came out of his door and walked along this way, over to where she lived. Sally was glad to see him, and he went into the kitchen and sat down and explained to her how he had built two new walls to his house and put in windows and made two tall chimneys, and how he had started the grass in front of his door. And now, Sally, he said, I want you to come over and see how well I've fixed things. I'll put on my bonnet and go right back with you, said Sally. But when she was ready to start, she said, We might go down cellar first and get some apples to eat on the way. So they went down cellar, like this. They got some apples and then came up outdoors by the hatchway, like this. Now they started for Tommy's house, but the walking was bad, and they had gone only a few steps when they tumbled down, like this. However, they were quickly up, like this. And they walked along until they were nearly to Tommy's house when they tumbled down again, like this. And they were no sooner up on their feet, like this, then they tumbled down once more like this. But they were nearly to Tommy's house now, and they got up and were going into the yard straight toward the door like this. When Sally pointed toward the doorstep and cried out, Oh, see that big black cat? End of section 43. Recording by Ginger Cucolo. Section 44 of In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. Edited by Olive Bobri Miller. The Wind and the Sun. Adapted from Aesop. The wind once blasted to the sun as he shook the tall tree tops and set all the leaves a trembling. Ho ho, friend sun. See how strong I am. You could never do that. Watch me. I can bend the great trees and break the little flowers off their stems. The sun answered quietly. Yes, but I can melt the ice and make the flowers and trees blossom. 
Still, the wind went on, blustering and boasting and shaking the treetops. Presently, they saw a man coming down the road. Then the sun said, I know how we can prove which one of us is the stronger. Whichever can make that man take off his coat will be shown to be stronger than the other. You try first. So the sun hid his big round face behind a cloud, and the wind began to blow as hard as he could upon the man. He raged and he snarled and he howled. He whipped and he tore and he tugged. But the harder he tried in these ways to force the man to take off his coat, the more closely did the man wrap it around him till at last the wind found that he could do nothing and that he had to give up trying altogether then the sun came gently out from behind the clouds warm and bright he shone on the man joyous and sparkling he smiled on him till at last the man felt that warmth all through and through he looked up with an answering smile at the shining round face in the sky then of his own wish he took off his coat so the sun had proved that his mild gentleness was far more powerful than all the wild bluster of the wind End of The Wind and the Sun Recording by Ellie in May 2012
I've run away from a little old woman. I've run away from a little old man. And I can run away from you, I can. So the cow ran after him. But the gingerbread boy shouted back, Run, 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 catch me if you can. You can't get me. I'm the gingerbread man. I am, I am. And the cow couldn't catch him. So the little gingerbread boy ran on and on. Soon he came to a horse. Please stop, little gingerbread boy, said the horse. You look very good to eat. But the little gingerbread boy called out, I've run away from a little old woman. I've run away from a little old man. I've run away from a cow. And I can run away from you, I can. So the horse ran after him. When the little gingerbread boy was past, he looked back and called, Run, 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 catch me if you can. You can't get me. I'm the gingerbread man. I am, I am. And the horse couldn't catch him. By and by, the little gingerbread boy came to a barn where threshers were working. The threshers saw him running and called out as they tried to pick him up. Here's a gingerbread boy. Mmm, mmm, he smells good. Do not run so fast, little gingerbread boy. You look good to eat. But the little gingerbread boy ran faster and faster and called out, Ho, ho, I've run away from a little old woman. I've run away from a little old man. I've run away from a cow. I've run away from a horse. And I can run away from you. I can, I can. So the threshers ran after him. But the gingerbread boy looked back and laughed, Run, 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 catch me if you can. You can't get me. I'm the gingerbread man. I am, I am and the threshers could not catch him. Then the little gingerbread boy ran faster than ever. He ran and ran till he came to a field full of mowers. When the mowers saw how fine he looked, they ran after him, calling out, Wait a bit, wait a bit, little gingerbread boy. We will eat you. But the little gingerbread boy laughed harder than ever and ran like the wind. Ahoy, ahoy, he cried. I've run away from a little old woman. I've run away from a little old man. I've run away from a cow. I've run away from a horse. I've run away from a barn full of threshers, and I can run away from you, I can, I can. And the mowers couldn't catch him. By this time, the little gingerbread boy was very proud of himself. He strutted, he danced, he pranced. He thought no one on earth could catch him. Pretty soon, he saw a fox coming across a field. The fox looked at him and began to run, but the little gingerbread boy ran faster still and shouted, Run, 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 catch me if you can. You can't get me. I'm the gingerbread man. I am, I am. I've run away from a little old woman. I've run away from a little old man. I've run away from a cow. I've run away from a horse. I've run away from a barn full of threshers. I've run away from a field full of mowers, and I can run away from you. I can, I can. Why, said the fox very politely, I wouldn't catch you if I could. I should never dream of disturbing you. Just then, the little gingerbread boy came to a river. He dared not jump into the water. He would have melted away, frosting cap and all if he had. Still, the cow, the horse, and the people were chasing hot on his heels, and he was forced to cross the river to keep out of their reach. Jump on my tail, and I will take you across, said the little fox. So the little gingerbread boy jumped on the fox's tail, and the fox swam into the river. A little distance from the shore, the fox said, Little gingerbread boy, I think you had better get on my back, or you may fall off. So the little gingerbread boy jumped on the fox's back. After swimming a little farther, the fox said, The water is deep. You may get wet where you are. Jump on my shoulder. So the little gingerbread boy jumped up on the fox's shoulder. When they were near the other side of the river, the fox cried out suddenly, The water grows deeper still. Jump up on my nose. Jump up on my nose. So the little gingerbread boy jumped up on the fox's nose. Then the fox sprang ashore in a twinkling and threw back his head and snip, snip, snap. At last and at last that gingerbread boy went the way of every single gingerbread boy that ever came out of an oven. End of section 46 Recording by Ginger Cucolo Section 47 of In the Nursery of My Bookhouse This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Timmy in the Nursery of My Bookhouse. Edited by Olive Beaupre Miller. The Crow and the Pitcher by Aesop. There once was a good old black crow, and he was very, very thirsty. He looked and looked for water, but all he could find was a little bit at the bottom of a deep pitcher. The crow put his beak into the pitcher and tried very hard to reach the water, but there was so little left that, try as he would, he could not get it. He turned and was about to go sorrowfully away when an idea came to him. He went back, picked up a pebble, and dropped it in the pitcher. Then he took another pebble and dropped that into the pitcher. Then he looked down in to see what had happened to the water. The pebbles had made the water rise just a little way. He would have to work hard to get pebbles enough to bring the water up to a place where he could reach it. At first he thought he would give up trying and fly away. Then he said to himself, No, though I seem to find so little change each time I drop in a pebble, if I keep right at my work and keep at it, at last I shall get my drink. So he went back patiently to work and dropped in another pebble, and another, and another. Little by little he saw the water rise. At last it came up where he could reach it. Then he put in his beak and was able to take the good drink of which he was so much in need. Little drops of water, little grains of sand, make a mighty ocean and a pleasant land. End of section 47. Recording by Timmy. Section 48 of In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sandra Luna. In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. Edited by Olive Burp Miller. O Look Oi, the Sandman, by Hans Christian Andersen. There is nobody in all the world who can tell so many stories as old Luke Oi, and such stories as he can tell. When night is drawing on, and the children are sitting round the table as good as possible, or on their little footstools, in walks all shut eyes. He comes so quietly up the stairs that nobody hears him, and puff! He sends a shower of milk into their eyes, in such fine spray as to be invisible, but they can't keep their eyes open after it, and so they never see him. He steals behind them and breathes upon their necks, making their heads as heavy as lead, but he never hurts them. He does it all from kindness to the children. He only wants them to be quiet, and the best way to make them quiet is to have them in bed. When they are settled there, he can tell them his stories. Then, as soon as the children are asleep, all shut eyes seats himself upon their beds. He is well dressed, his clothes are all of silk, but it is impossible to say what color they are, for it shimmers green, red, and blue every time he turns. He has an umbrella under his arm, one with pictures on it, and this he holds over the good children, and then they dream the most delightful stories all night long. The other umbrella has no pictures on it, and he holds this one over the children who have been naughty, and then they sleep heavily till the morning and have no dreams at all. I am now going to tell you about a little boy to whom all look oi went every night for a whole week. His name was Yalmer. As soon as Yalmer was in bed on Tuesday night, old shut eyes touched all the furniture in the room with his little wooden wand, and everything began to talk. There was a big picture in a gilt frame hanging over the chest of drawers. In it one saw tall old trees, flowers growing in the grass, and a great piece of water, with a river flowing from it round behind a wood, past many castles and away to the open sea. Old Luke Oi touched the picture with his wand, and the birds in it began to sing. The branches of the tree moved, 
and the clouds scudded along, you could see their shadows passing over the landscape. Now Old Luke Oy lifted little Yalmer up close to the frame, and Yalmer put his leg right into the picture among the long grass, and there he stood. The sun shone down upon him through the branches of the trees. He ran to the water and got into a little boat which lay there. It was painted red and white, and the sails shone like silver. Six swans, all with golden crowns round their necks, and a shining silver star upon their heads, drew the boat past the dark green woods, where the trees told stories, and the flowers told other stories about the pretty little elves and all that the butterflies had told them. Beautiful fish with gold and silver scales swam after the boat. Every now and then they sprang out of the water and back again with a splash. Red and blue birds, large and small, flew in two long lines behind them. The knots buzzed and the maybugs boomed. They all wanted to go with Yalmar, and each of them had a story to tell. That was a sailing trip indeed. Now the woods were thick and dark, now they were like beautiful gardens full of sunshine and flowers, and among them were castles of glass and marble. Princesses stood upon the balconies, and they were all little girls whom Yalmar knew and used to play with. They stretched out their hands, each one holding the most beautiful sugar pig, which any cake woman could sell. Yalmar took hold of one end of a pig as he sailed by, and the princess held the other tight, and each had a share, she the smaller and Yalmar the bigger. Little princes stood sentry by each castle. They saluted him with golden swords and showered down sugar plums and tin soldiers. They were princes indeed. Now he sailed through a wood, now through great holes, or right through a town. He passed through the one where his nurse lived, she who used to carry him about when he was quite a little boy and who was so fond of him. She nodded and waved her hand to him and sang a pretty little song which she had written herself and sent to Yamal. I dream of thee for many an hour, Yalmer, my own, my sweeting. My kisses once fell like a shower, thy brown and red cheeks greeting. Mine ear thy first form word addressed, thy last must be in parting. May you on earth by heaven be blessed, angel, from heaven were darting. All the birds sang too. The flowers danced upon their stalks, and the old trees nodded, just as if old Luke Oy were telling them stories. I'll tell you what, said old Shut Eyes, when he came to Yomar on Thursday night. Don't be frightened and I will show you a little mouse. And he stretched out his hands with a tiny little animal in it. It has come to invite you to a wedding. There are two little mice who intend to be married tonight. They live under the floor of your mother's pantry, which they say is the most delightful home. But how can I get through a little mouse hole in the floor? said Yama. Leave that to me said old Luke Oy. I'll soon make you small enough. Then he touched Yomar with his wand, and he quickly grew smaller and smaller. At last he was not as tall as one's finger. Now you may borrow the tin soldier's clothes. I think they'll just fit you. And it looks so smart to have on a uniform when one's in company. Yes, indeed, said Yomar and in a moment he was dressed like the grandest tin soldier. Be so good as to make a seat in your mother's thimble, said the little mouse, and I shall have the honour of drawing you. Heavens, are you going to take that trouble yourself, young lady? said Yama, and off they drove to the mouse's wedding. First they went down under the floor, into a long passage, which was just high enough for them to drive through and the whole passage was lighted up with touchwood. "'Isn't there a delicious smell here?' said the mouse, 
who was drawing him. The whole passage has been smeared over with bacon fat. Nothing could be nicer. Then they came to the bridal hall, where all the little lady mice stood on the right, whispering and giggling, as if they were making fun of each other, and on the left stood all the gentlemen mice, stroking their whiskers with their paws. The bridal pair stood in the middle of the room, in the hollow rindle of a cheese, kissing each other. More and more visitors poured in, and the bridal pair took their place in the doorway, so that one could get neither in nor out. The whole room, like the passage, was smeared with bacon fat. There were no other refreshments, but for dessert a pea was produced, in which one of the little mice of the family had bitten the name of the bridal pair, that is to say, the first letter of it, and this was something quite extraordinary. All the mice said it was a delightful wedding, and the conversation most entertaining. And then Yamal drove home again. He had been in very grand company, but in order to get there he had been obliged to shrink wonderfully, to make himself small enough to get into the uniform of a tin soldier. End of section 48 O Luke Oil, The Sandman Section 49 of In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. Edited by Olive Bopery Miller. Winken, Blinken, and Nod by Eugene Field. Winken, Blinken, and Nod one night sailed off in a wooden shoe sailed on a river of crystal light into a sea of dew where are you going and what do you wish the old moon asked the three we have come to fish for the herring fish that live in this beautiful sea nets of silver and gold have we said winken blinken and nod the old moon laughed and sang a song as they rocked in the wooden shoe and the wind that sped them all night long ruffled the waves of dew the little stars were the herring fish that lived in that beautiful sea. Now cast your nets wherever you wish, but never afeard are we. So cried the stars to the fishermen three, Winken, Blinken, and Nod. All night long their nets they threw to the stars in the twinkling foam. Then down from the skies came the wooden shoe, bringing the fishermen home. "'Twas all so pretty a sail, it seemed as if it could not be, "'and some folks thought twas a dream they dreamed of sailing that beautiful sea. "'But I shall name you the fishermen three, Winken, Blinken, and Nod. "'Winken and Blinken are two little eyes, and Nod is a little head, "'and the wooden shoe that sailed the skies is a wee one's trundle bed. "'So shut your eyes while mother sings of wonderful sights that be, and you shall see the beautiful things as you rock on the misty sea, where the old shoe rocked the fishermen three, Winken, Blinken, and Nod. End of section 49. Read by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org, in May 2012, in San Diego, California. Section 50 of In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Verity Kendall. In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. Edited by Olive Bupra Miller. The Sugar Plum Tree by Eugene Field. Have you ever heard of the Sugar Plum Tree? Tis a marvel of great renown. It blooms on the shore of the lollipop sea in the garden of Shut Eye Town. The fruit that it bears is so wondrously sweet, as those that have tasted it say, that good little children have only to eat of that fruit to be happy next day. When you've got to the tree, you would have a hard time to capture the fruit which I sing. The tree is so tall that no person could climb to the boughs where the sugar plums swing. But in that tree sits a chocolate cat, and a gingerbread dog prowls below. And this is the way you contrive to get at those sugar plums tempting you so. 
You say but the word to that gingerbread dog, and he barks with such terrible jest that the chocolate cat is at once all agog, as her swelling proportions attest. And the chocolate cat goes cavorting around from this leafy limb unto that, and the sugar plums tumble, of course, to the ground. Hurrah for that chocolate cat! There are marshmallows, gumdrops, and peppermint canes with stripings of scarlet and gold, and you carry away of the treasure that reigns as much as your apron can hold. So come, little child cuddle closer to me in your dainty white nightcap and gown and i'll rock you away to that sugar plum tree in the garden of shut eye town end of section fifty recording by verity candle section fifty one of in the nursery of my book house this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rebecca, www.bluebird-experience.com In the Nursery of My Bookhouse, edited by Olive Beaupre Miller, The Milkmaid and Her Pail. Patty, the milkmaid, was going to market carrying her milk in a shiny pail on her head. As she went along, she began telling herself what she would do with the money she would get for the milk. I'll buy some eggs from Farmer Brown, said she, and put them under the little brown hen. Then the little brown hen will hatch me out a lot of little chicks, and the little chicks will grow up to be hens, and those hens will lay me dozens of eggs. I'll sell the eggs for a great deal of money. Then, with the money I get from the eggs, I'll buy me a new white dress and a hat with pink flowers and blue ribbons. Oh, won't I look fine when I go to market in my new white dress and my hat with pink flowers and blue ribbons? Won't everybody stand about and look at me? Polly Shaw will be there to stand and look, and Molly Parsons will be there to stand and look, and Jack Squires will be there to stand and look. But I shall just walk past them all and hold my chin high and toss my head like this. As she spoke, she tossed her head back, the pail fell off, and all the milk was spilled. So she had nothing at all to sell, and all her fine dream was brought to nothing. She had to go home and tell her mother what had happened. Ah, oh, my child, said her mother, do not count your chickens before they are hatched. Little maid, pretty maid, whither goest thou? down in the forest to milk my cow shall i go with thee no not now when i send for thee then come thou end of section 51 recording by rebecca section 52 in the nursery of my bookhouse this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeannie Hall In the Nursery of My Bookhouse Edited by Olive Beaupre Miller The Lion and the Mouse Adapted from Aesop Once, a great lion lay asleep in the forest. Suddenly, a little teeny tiny mouse began running up and down on him. This soon awakened the lion, and when he saw the mouse, he stretched out his huge shaggy paw and caught him, then opened his jaws to swallow him. But the little mouse squeaked out, Mercy, O king, let me go this time. Do not swallow me, and I shall never forget your kindness. Who knows? If you let me go, I may be able to help you some day. Help me? You help me? chuckled the lion, greatly amused that a little teeny tiny mouse should even think himself able to help so powerful a creature as the king of beasts. Oh, very well, then. I'll let you go. He lifted his paw, and the mouse scampered quickly away. Some time after this, the lion was wandering about in the forest when he fell into a trap that had been set by some hunters to catch him. 
These hunters wished to take the splendid big beast, a captive to the king. So they came and drew him out of the trap, then tied him to a tree while they went to fetch a wagon in which they might carry him to the palace. The lion pulled and tore and tugged at the rope, but all to no purpose. He could not get loose. At last he cried sadly, They have me fast. I cannot get away. Just then, the little teeny tiny mouse came by. Well, well, friend lion, he squeaked. What's this that has happened to you? The hunters have bound me fast, groaned the lion. Alas, they will carry me captive off to the king, for I cannot get away. Is that all that has happened? said the mouse, and he came straight up to the lion and began to gnaw at the rope that bound him. Little by little, with his sharp teeth, he cut the strands of the rope until he had gnawed it quite in two and set the big beast free. There, said the little teeny tiny mouse, was I not right? No matter how little one is, there may come a time when he will prove useful even to the greatest. End of section 52 Recording by Jeannie Hall, Eldersburg, Maryland Section 53 of In the Nursery of My Bookhouse This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org In the Nursery of My Bookhouse Edited by Olive Beaupre Miller Old Shellover by Walter de la Mare. Come, said old Shellover. What? says Creep. The horny old gardener's fast asleep. The fat cock thrush to his nest has gone, and the dew shines bright in the rising moon. Old Sally Worm from her hole doth peep. Come, said old Shellover. Ay, said Creep. End of section 53. Section 54 of In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tara Dow. In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. Edited by Olive Bupri Miller. The Little Rabbit Who Wanted Red Wings. Retold by Carolyn Sherwin Bailey. Once upon a time, there was a little white rabbit with two beautiful long pink ears and two bright red eyes and four soft little feet. Such a pretty little white rabbit, but he wasn't happy. Just think, this little white rabbit wanted to be somebody else instead of the nice little rabbit that he was. When Mr. Bushytail, the gray squirrel, went by, the little white rabbit would say to his mammy, Oh, mammy, I wish I had a long gray tail like Mr. Bushytail's. And when Mr. Porcupine went by, the little white rabbit would say to his mammy, Oh, mammy, I wish I had a back full of bristles like Mr. Porcupine's. And when Miss Puddle Duck went by, in her two little red rubbers, the little white rabbit would say, Oh, Mammy, I wish I had a pair of red rubbers like Miss Puddle Duck's. So he went on and on wishing, until his Mammy was clean tired out with all his wishing, and old Mr. Groundhog heard him one day. Old Mr. Groundhog is very wise indeed. So he said to the little white rabbit, Why don't y'all go down to the wishing pond, and if you look in the water at yourself and turn around three times in a circle, y'all will get your wish. So the little white rabbit trotted off, all alone by himself, through the woods until he came to a little pool of green water lying in a low tree stump, and that was the wishing pond. There was a little, little bird, all red, sitting on the edge of the wishing pond to get a drink, and as soon as the little white rabbit saw him, 
he began to wish again. Oh, I wish I had a pair of little red wings, he said. Just then he looked in the wishing pond and he saw his little white face. Then he turned around three times and something happened. He began to have a queer feeling in his shoulders, like that he felt in his mouth when he was cutting his teeth. It was his wings coming through. So he sat all day in the woods by the wishing pond, waiting for them to grow, and by and by, when it was almost sundown, he started home to see his mummy and show her, because he had a beautiful pair of long, trailing red wings. But by the time he reached home, it was getting dark, and when he went in the hole at the foot of a big tree where he lived, his mommy didn't know him. No, she really and truly did not know him, because, you see, she had never seen a rabbit with red wings in all her life. And so the little white rabbit had to go out again, because his mommy wouldn't let him get into his own bed. He had to go out and look for some place to sleep all night. He went and went until he came to Mr. Bushytail's house, and he rapped on the door and said, Please, kind Mr. Bushytail, may I sleep in your house all night? But Mr. Bushytail opened his door a crack, and then he slammed it tight shut again. You see, he had never seen a rabbit with red wings in all his life. So the little white rabbit went and went until he came to Miss Puddle Duck's nest down by the marsh, and he said, Please, kind Miss Puddle Duck, may I sleep in your nest all night? But Miss Puddle Duck poked her head up out of her nest just a little way, and then shut her eyes and stretched her wings out so far that she covered her whole nest. You see, she had never seen a rabbit with red wings in all her life. So the little white rabbit went and went until he came to old Mr. Groundhog's hole, and old Mr. Groundhog let him sleep with him all night, but the hole had beech nuts spread all over it. Old Mr. Groundhog liked to sleep on them, but they hurt the little white rabbit's feet and made him very uncomfortable before morning. When it came to morning, the little white rabbit decided to try his wings and fly a little, so he climbed up on a hill and spread his wings and sailed off. But he landed in a low bush all full of prickles, and his four feet got mixed up with the twigs, so he couldn't get down. Mommy! 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 Come help me! he called. His mammy didn't hear him, but old Mr. Groundhog did and he came and helped the little white rabbit out of the prickly bush. "'Don't y'all want your red wings?' Mr. Groundhog asked. "'No, no,' said the little white rabbit. "'Well,' said the old groundhog, "'why don't y'all go down to the wishing pond and wish them off again?' So the little white rabbit went down to the wishing pond, and he saw his face in it. Then he turned around three times, and sure enough, his red wings were gone. Then he went home to his mammy, who knew him right away and was so glad to see him. And he never, never wished to be something different from what he really was again. End of section 54 Recording by Tara Dow Section 55 of In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. Edited by Olive Beaupre Miller. The Dog in the Manger. A dog that wanted to take an afternoon nap once found a soft place on the straw in the manger of an ox. So he lay down there, curled himself up cosily, and soon fell asleep. In the evening the ox returned from his long day's work, thinking to rest and eat some of the straw. But when he came up to the manger he awakened the dog. Angry at being aroused from his sleep, the dog stood up and began to bark in the ugliest way. "'Pray go away and let me have my evening meal,' said the ox. 
Bow wow. Grr, grr, go away, growled the dog. The straw is no longer of any use to you, said the ox. Your nap is over, so jump down and let me eat. Bow wow. Grr, grr, go away, growled the dog. You dogs do not eat straw, said the ox. So why should you hold your place there and keep me from my evening meal? Bow wow. Grr, grr, go away growled the dog, and no matter what the ox said to him, he kept on barking, growling, snapping, and snarling, whenever the big, good-natured creature reached for a mouthful to eat. At last the ox had to give up all hope of getting his evening meal, and went away, leaving the straw to the dog, who had no use for it whatever. "'Ah!' muttered the ox. "'Some people do not want others to have that which they cannot enjoy themselves.' End of section 55. Read by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org, in May 2012 in San Diego, California. Section 56 of In the Nursery of My Book House. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Verity Kendall In the Nursery of My Book House Edited by Olive Bupra Miller I Wouldn't Be a Growler by Mary Mapes Dodge I wouldn't be a growler, I wouldn't be a bear, I wouldn't be an owlet always on the stair, I wouldn't be a monkey doing foolish tricks, I wouldn't be a donkey full of sullen kicks, I wouldn't be a goose nor a peacock full of pride, but I would be a big boy with a pocket on each side. End of section 56. Recording by Verity Kendall. Section 57 of In the Nursery of My Book House. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by A Quiet Girl. In the Nursery of My Book House. Edited by Olive Bray Miller. The Jay and the Peacocks, adapted from Aesop. A Jay once made his way into a yard where peacocks walked. There he found a number of beautiful feathers, blue and green and gold, which had fallen from the peacocks. The rusty old Jay tied all his splendid feathers to his tail. Then, feeling very fine indeed, he strutted down to show himself off to the peacocks. At first glance they thought him one of themselves, but as he went parading before them, they soon discovered that he was not a peacock at all. So they ran up to him, squawking and scolding, and pecked at him till they had plucked away every one of his borrowed plumes and half of his own besides. Soon the foolish Jay found himself left in disgrace, with nothing better to show than his own torn and rusty feathers. Sheepishly, he went back to his brother Jay's. But the Jay's had watched what he had done from a distance, and they thought it so foolish that they began to scold and screech at him as soon as he drew near them. It takes more than fine feathers, you silly, to make a fine bird. End of section 57. The Jay and the Peacocks. Section 58 of In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Donna Winters. In the Nursery of My Bookhouse, edited by Olive Bupre Miller, story by Lawrence Alma Tadima, Strange Lands. Where do you come from, Mr. J? From the land of play, from the land of play. And where can that be, Mr. J? Far away, far away. Where do you come from, Mrs. Dobb? From the land of love, from the land of love. And how do you get there, Mrs. Dobb? Look above, look above. Where do you come from, baby miss? From the land of bliss. From the land of bliss. And what is the way there, baby miss? Mother's kiss. Mother's kiss. End of section 58. Recording by Donna Winters. Section 59 of In the Nursery of My Book House. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Verity Kendall. In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. Edited by Olive Bupra Miller. Snow by Mary Mapes Dodge. Little white feathers filling the air. Little white feathers, how came you there? We came from the cloud birds sailing so high. They're shaking their white wings up in the sky. Little white feathers, how swift you go. Little white snowflakes, I love you so. We are swift because we have work to do, but hold up your face and we'll kiss you true. End of section 59. Recording by Verity Kendall. Section 60 of In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Verity Kendall. In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. Edited by Olive Bupra Miller. Wee Robin's Christmas Song. A Scotch Folk Tale. There was once an old grey pussy, and she went for a walk one Christmas morning to see what she could see. As she was walking by the waterside, she saw a wee wee Robin Redbreast hopping about on a bush. Good morning, Robin Redbreast, said she. Where are you going on this cold and frosty morning? I'm going to the king, answered the wee robin, to sing him a song on this merry Christmas morning. Oh, but wait before you go, said the pussy. Just hop down to me a minute, and I'll show you a bonny white ring that I have around my neck. But Robin looked down on Pussy with a twinkle in his eye. Ha ha, grey Pussy, said he. You may show your white ring to the little grey mouse, but I'll not wait to let you show it to me. I'll go straight on to the king. So he spread his wings and flew away. And he flew, and he flew, and he flew, till he came to a fence where he saw a greedy old hawk who was looking about for breakfast. Good morning, Robin Redbreast, cried the greedy old hawk. Where are you going on this cold and frosty morning? I'm going to the king, answered the wee robin, to sing him a song on this merry Christmas morning. Oh, but wait before you go, said the greedy old hawk. I will show you a bonny green feather I have in my wing. But the wee robin did not like the look in the eye of the greedy old hawk. Ha ha, old hawk, said he, I will let you peck at the tiny birds, but I'll not wait to let you peck at me. I'll go straight on to the king. So he spread his wings and flew away. And he flew, and he flew, and he flew, till he came to a hillside where he saw a sly old fox looking out of his hole. Good morning, Robin Redbreast, said the sly old fox. Where are you going on this cold and frosty morning? I'm going to the king, answered the wee robin, to sing him a song on this merry Christmas morning. Oh, but wait before you go, said the sly old fox, and let me show you a queer black spot I have on the end of my tail. Ha ha, sly fox said the robin. I saw you worry the wee lamby, and I'll not wait to see the spot on your tail. I'll go straight to the king. So the robin flew away once more, and never rested till he came to a rosy-cheeked boy, who sat on a log and ate a big piece of bread and butter. Then he perched on a branch and watched him. Good morning, robin redbreast, said the boy. Where are you going on this cold and frosty morning? I'm going to the king, answered the wee robin to sing him a song on this merry Christmas morning. Come a bit nearer, said the boy, and I'll give you some crumbs from my bread. Nay, nay, my wee man, chirped the robin. I saw you catch the goldfinch, and I'll not wait for your crumbs. I'll go straight on to the king. So no matter who begged him to stop and wait, the wee robin flew straight on to the king, and he lit on the window sill of the palace. There he sat and sang the sweetest song he knew. So happy was he, because it was the blessed Christmas tide, that he wanted the whole wide world to be as happy as he, and he sang, and he sang, and he sang. The king and queen sat at the window, and they were so pleased with his cheery song, that they asked each other what they could do to pay him for his loving thought in coming so far to greet them. I know what we can do, said the queen. We can give him bonny wee Jenny Wren for his mate. Then the king clapped his hands and called for Jenny Wren. And the wee wee robin and the wee wee wren sat side by side on the window sill, and they sang and they sang and they sang on that merry Christmas morning. Sing, little bird. Sing, little bird, when the skies are blue. Sing for the world that has need of you. Sing when the skies are overcast. Sing when the rain is falling fast. Sing, happy heart, when the sun is warm. 
Sing in the winter's coldest storm. Sing little songs, O oh heart so true. Sing for the world that has need of you. End of section 60 Recording by Verity Kendall Section 61 of In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Carissa Bacon. In the Nursery of My Bookhouse, edited by Olive Beaupre Miller. Little Gustava by Celia Baxter. Little Gustava sits in the sun safe in the porch and the little drops run from the icicles under the eaves so fast for the bright spring sun shines warm at last and glad is little gustava she wears a quaint little scarlet cap and a little green bowl she holds in her lap filled with bread and milk to the brim and a wreath of marigolds round the rim ha ha laughs little gustava up comes her little gray coaxing cat with her little pink nose and she mews what's that Gustava feeds her, and she begs for more, and a little brown hen walks in at the door. Good day, cries little Gustava. She scatters crumbs for the little brown hen. There comes a rush and a flutter, and then down fly her little white doves so sweet, with their snowy wings and their crimson feet. Welcome, cries little Gustava. So dainty and eager they pick up the crumbs. But who is this through the doorway comes? Little Scotch terrier little dog rags looks in her face and his funny tail wags ha ha laughs little gustava you want some breakfast too and down she sets her bowl on the brick floor brown and little dog rags drinks up her milk while she strokes his shaggy locks like silk dear rags says little gustava waiting without stood sparrow and crow cooling their feet in the melting snow won't you come in good folk she cried but they were too bashful and stayed outside. So pray come in, cried Gustava. So the last she threw them and knelt on the mat with doves and biddy and dog and cat. And her mother came to the open house door. Dear little daughter, I bring you some more, my merry little Gustava. Kitty and terrier, biddy and doves, all things harmless, Gustava loves. The shy, kind creatures, tis joy to feed, and oh, her breakfast is sweet indeed to happy little Gustava. End of section. Section 62 of In the Nursery of My Book House. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeanie Hall In the Nursery of My Bookhouse Edited by Olive Beaupre Miller The Magpie's Nest, an English Folk Tale Once upon a time, when pigs spake rhyme, And ducks went quack, 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 oh, All the birds of the air came to Madge Magpie, Way up in a treetop, and asked her to teach them How to build their nests. The thrush came in her glossy brown coat, the blackbird came in his rusty black. The owl came in his best speckled vest, with great round goggles over his eyes. The sparrow came in dust color. The starling came in black satin, all shiny with purple and green. And the turtle dove came in her softest gray. On the branches above Madge Magpie they perched, and all began to sing at once. Madge Magpie, oh Madge Magpie, pray will you teach us how to build such nests as you do upon the swaying bough? There's no one in the treetops who knows so well as you how birds should build their houses, caw caw, to wit, to woo. Madge Magpie gave a swish to her long silk train and smoothed down her wide white sash. Then she answered, Come sit in a circle about me, if you're good, I will show you how to build just such nests as I do, way up on the swaying bough. First she took some mud and made it into a neat round cake. Oh, that's how it's done, is it? cried the thrush, and she wouldn't wait another minute to hear any more. 
off she flew, and she sang as she went, Quit, 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 that's all there is to it. Mud you take and make a cake. Quit, quit, quit. So that's all the thrush ever learned about how to build a nest. Then Madge Magpie took some twigs and arranged them in the mud. Oh, that's how it's done, is it? cried the blackbird. Now I know all about it. Here I go to make my nest in a big oak tree in the cornfield. Mud in a cake, I saw, I saw. Twigs in the mud, caw, caw. So that's all the blackbird ever learned about how to build a nest. Then Madge Magpie put another layer of mud over the twigs. Oh, I knew all that before I came, said the old owl, who thought himself so wise, and away he flew to build his nest in the bell tower of the church. To wit, to woo, I knew, I knew, I'll build my nest as I always do. So that's all the owl ever learned about how to build a nest. After this, the magpie took some twigs and twined them around the outside to make the nest firm and strong. The very thing, cried the sparrow. Why stay to hear more? I'll go make my nest in the hedgerow. Chip, 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 chip. I know enough, and now I'll skip. So that's all the sparrow ever learned about how to build a nest. Well, then Madge Magpie took some feathers and soft stuff and lined the nest all cozy and snug. That suits me, screeched the starling, and off he flew to build his nest in a little hole in the old stone schoolhouse. Check, check, screech. I'll build way out of reach. And when my little ones come out, we'll screech with the noisy din about. So that's all the starling ever learned about how to build a nest. Meanwhile, Madge Magpie went on working and working without looking up, till the only bird that was left was the turtle dove, and she hadn't paid any attention all along. She had only kept on repeating her silly cry, Coo, coo, take two, Taffy, take two. Madge Magpie noticed what the dove was saying just as she was putting a twig across. So she said, No, you don't take two, take one. One's enough. But the turtle dove kept on saying, Coo, coo, take two, Taffy, take two. One's enough, I tell you. Don't you see how I lay it across? But the turtle dove liked only to hear herself talk, so she kept on saying, Coo, coo, take two, Taffy, take two. At last, and at last, Madge Magpie looked up and saw nobody near her but the silly turtle dove, and then she cried, How can I teach silly birds to build nests if they will not listen to what I say? And away she flew, nor would she ever again tell them what to do. End of section 62. Recording by Jeannie Hall, Eldersburg, Maryland. Section 63 of In the Nursery of My Book House. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Frog and the Ox, adapted from Aesop. Once a little frog came hopping in great excitement up to a big frog, who sat by the side of a pool. Oh, brother, said the little frog, I have just seen such a great big monster. It was as big as a mountain with horns on its head and a long tail, and it had hoofs, divided in two. I am sure it's the largest creature in all the world. Tush, child, tush, said the big frog, that was only Farmer White's ox. You have seen so little of the world that you thought him very much larger than he is. Really, he isn't so much bigger than I. He may be a little taller, but I could easily make myself quite as broad. Just you see. And he blew himself out, and blew himself out, and blew himself out. Was he as big as this? he asked, holding his breath. Oh, much bigger than that, said the young frog. So the older one blew himself out again, and blew himself out again, and blew himself out again. There, was he as big as this? he asked then. Bigger, brother, bigger was still the reply. Now the big frog was so determined to show himself as large as the ox that he took another breath deeper than all he had taken before, and he blew and he blew and he blew, and he swelled and he swelled and he swelled. At last he said in his squeaky little voice, I am sure the ox is not as big as, but at this moment he swelled himself out so hard that he burst. He who thinks himself so big may find himself nothing at all. 
End of section 63. Recording by Ellie in May 2012. Section 64 of In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Verity Kendall. In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. Edited by Olive Bupro Miller. It by James Whitcomb Riley. A wee little worm in a hickory nut sang happy as he could be. Oh, I live in the heart of the whole round world, and it all belongs to me. End of section 64. Recording by Verity Kendall. Section 65 of In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeannie Hall. In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. Edited by Olive Beaupre Miller. Mrs. Tabby Gray. By Maud Lindsay. Mrs. Tabby Gray, with her three little kittens, lived out in the barn where the hay was stored. One of the kittens was white, one was black, and one gray, just like her mother, who was called Tabby Gray from the color of her coat. These three little kittens opened their eyes when they grew old enough and thought there was nothing so nice in all this wonderful world as their own dear mother although she told them of a great many nice things, like milk and bread, which they should have when they could go up to the big house where she had her breakfast, dinner, and supper. Every time Mother Tabby came from the big house, she had something pleasant to tell. Bones for dinner today, my dears, she would say. Or, I had a fine romp with a ball and the baby, until the kittens longed for the time when they could go too. One day, however, Mother Cat walked in with joyful news. I have found an elegant new home for you, she said, in a very large trunk, where some old clothes are kept, and I think I had better move at once. Then she picked up the small black kitten, without any more words, and walked right out of the barn with him. The black kitten was astonished, but he blinked his eyes at the bright sunshine and tried to see everything. Out in the barnyard there was a great noise, for the white hen had laid an egg and wanted everybody to know it. But Mother Cat hurried on, without stopping to inquire about it, and soon dropped the kitten into the large trunk. The clothes made such a soft, comfortable bed, and the kitten was so tired after his exciting trip that he fell asleep, and Mrs. Tabby trotted off for another baby. While she was away, the lady who owned the trunk came out in the hall. And when she saw that the trunk was open, she shut it, locked it, and put the key in her pocket, for she did not dream that there was anything so precious as a kitten inside. As soon as the lady had gone upstairs, Mrs. Tabby Gray came back with the little white kitten, and when she found the trunk closed, she was terribly frightened. She put the white kitten down and sprang on top of the trunk, and scratched with all her might, but scratching did no good. Then she jumped down and reached up to the keyhole, but that was too small for even a mouse to pass through, and the poor mother mewed pitifully. What was she to do? She picked up the white kitten and ran to the barn with it. Then she made haste to the house again and went upstairs to the lady's room. The lady was playing with her baby, and when Mother Cat saw this, she rubbed against her skirts and cried, Meow! Meow! You have your baby, and I want mine! Meow! Meow! By and by the lady said, Poor kitty! She must be hungry! And she went down to the kitchen and poured sweet milk in a saucer. But the cat did not want milk. She wanted her baby kitten out of the big black trunk. 
the kind lady decided that she must be thirsty. Poor kitty, I will give you water. But when she set the bowl of water down, Mrs. Tabby Gray mewed more sorrowfully than before. She wanted no water. She only wanted her dear baby kitten, and she ran to and fro, crying, until at last the lady followed her, and she led the way to the trunk. "'What can be the matter with this cat?' said the lady. And she took the trunk key out of her pocket, put it in the lock, unlocked the trunk, raised the top, and in jumped Mother Cat with such a bound that the little black kitten waked up with a start. Prrr, prrr, my darling child, said Mrs. Tabby Gray in great excitement, and before the black kitten could ask one question, she picked him up and started for the barn. The sun was bright in the barnyard, and the hens were still chattering there, but the black kitten was glad to get back to the barn. His mother was glad, too, for as she nestled down in the hay with her three little kittens, she told them that a barn was the best place, after all, to raise children. And she never afterwards changed her mind. End of section 65 Recording by Jeanie Hall, Eldersburg, Maryland Section 66 of In the Nursery of My Book House. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rebecca, www.bluebird-experience.com. In the Nursery of My Book House, edited by Olive Beaupre Miller. THE KITTEN AND THE FALLING LEAVES by William Wordsworth See the kitten on the wall, sporting with the leaves that fall. Withered leaves, one, two, and three, from the lofty elder tree. But the kitten, how she starts, crouches, stretches, paws and darts, first at one, and then its fellow, just as light and just as yellow. With a tiger leap, halfway, now she meets the coming prey, lets it go as fast and then has it in her paws again. End of section 66. Recording by Rebecca. Section 67 of In the Nursery of My Book House. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chris Hughes In the Nursery of My Bookhouse, edited by Olive Bopra Miller The Tale of Peter Rabbit by Beatrix Potter Once upon a time there were four little rabbits, and their names were Flopsy, Mopsy, Cottontail, and Peter. They lived with their mother in a sandbank underneath the root of a very big fir tree. Now, my dears, said Mrs. Rabbit one morning, you may go into the fields or down the lane, but don't go into Mr. McGregor's garden. Now run along, and don't get into mischief. I am going out. Then old Mrs. Rabbit took a basket and her umbrella and went through the wood to the baker's. She bought a loaf of brown bread and five currant buns. Flopsy, Mopsy, and Cottontail, who were good little bunnies, went down the lane to gather blackberries. But Peter, very naughtily, ran straight away to Mr. McGregor's garden and squeezed under the gate. First he ate some lettuces and some French beans, and then he ate some radishes, and then he went to look for some parsley, but round the end of a cucumber frame, whom should he meet but Mr. McGregor? Mr. McGregor was on his hands and knees planting young cabbages, but he jumped up and ran after Peter, waving a rake and calling out, Stop, thief! Peter was most dreadfully frightened. He rushed all over the garden, for he had forgotten the way back to the gate. 
he lost one of his shoes among the cabbages, and the other shoe amongst the potatoes. After losing them, he ran on four legs, and went faster, so that I think he might have got away altogether if he'd not unfortunately run into a gooseberry net, and got caught by the large buttons on his jacket. It was a blue jacket with brass buttons, quite new. Peter gave himself up for lost, and shed big tears, but his sobs were overheard by some friendly sparrows, who flew to him in great excitement, and implored him to exert himself. Mr. McGregor came up with a sieve, which he intended to pop upon the top of Peter, but Peter wriggled out just in time, leaving his jacket behind him. He rushed into the tool-shed, and jumped into a can. It would have been a beautiful thing to hide in, if it had not had so much water in it. Mr. McGregor was quite sure that Peter was somewhere in the tool-shed, perhaps hidden underneath a flower-pot. He began to turn them over, carefully, looking under each. Presently Peter sneezed. Katishu! Mr. McGregor was after him in no time, and tried to put his foot upon Peter, who jumped out of a window, upsetting three plants. The window was too small for Mr. McGregor, and he was tired of running after Peter. He went back to work. Peter sat down to rest. He was out of breath, and he had not the least idea which way to go. After a time he began to wander about, going lippity-lippity, not very fast, and looking all around. He found a door in a wall, but it was locked, and there was no room for a fat little rabbit to squeeze underneath. An old mouse was running in and out over the stone doorstep, carrying peas and beans to her family in the wood. Peter asked her the way to the gate, but she had such a large pea in her mouth that she could not answer. She only shook her head at him. Peter began to cry. Then he tried to find his way across the garden, but he became more and more puzzled. Presently he came to the pond, where Mr. McGregor filled his water cans. A white cat was staring at some goldfish. She sat very, very still, but now and then the top of her tail twitched as if it were alive. Peter thought it best to go away without speaking to her. He had heard about cats from his cousin, little Benjamin Bunny. He went back towards the tool-shed, but suddenly, quite close to him, he heard the noise of a hoe. Scritch, scratch, scratch, scratch. Peter scuttled underneath the bushes. But presently, as nothing happened, he came out and climbed upon a wheelbarrow and peeped over. The first thing he saw was Mr. McGregor hoeing onions. His back was turned towards Peter, and beyond him was the gate. Peter got down very quietly off the wheelbarrow and started running as fast as he could go along a straight walk behind some blackcurrant bushes. Mr. McGregor caught sight of him at the corner, but Peter did not care. He slipped underneath the gate and was safe at last in the wood outside the garden. Mr. McGregor hung up the little jacket and the shoes for a scarecrow to frighten the blackbirds. Peter never stopped running or looked behind him till he got home to the big fir tree. He was so tired that he flopped down upon the nice soft sand on the floor of the rabbit hole and shut his eyes. His mother was busy cooking. She wondered what he'd done with his clothes. It was the second little jacket and pair of shoes that Peter had lost in a fortnight. I am sorry to say that Peter was not very well during the evening. His mother put him to bed and made some chamomile tea, and she gave a dose of it to Peter, one tablespoonful to be taken at bedtime. But Flopsy, Mopsy, and Cottontail had bread and milk and blackberries for supper. End of section 67「Section 68 of In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jill Janovitz. In the Nursery of My Bookhouse, edited by Olive Bapri Miller. Rosie Posey by Laura E. Richards. There was a little Rosie, and she had a little nosy, 
and she made a little posy all pink and white and green and she said little nosy will you smell my little posy for all the flowers that growsy such sweet ones ne'er were seen so she took the little posy and she put it to her nosy on her little face so rosy the flowers for to smell and which of them was rosy and which of them was nosy and which of them was posy you really could not tell end of section 68Section 69 of In the Nursery of My Book House. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ginger Cucolo. In the Nursery of My Book House. Edited by Olive Bupre Miller. The Little Engine That Could. Once there was a train of cars and she was flying merrily across the country with a load of Christmas toys for the children who lived away over on the other side of the mountain. Her wheels went round ever so fast, squealing along the track and leaving the rails humming and singing behind them. Choo-choo! 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 She was such a happy little train of cars, so pleased with the load she was carrying, and she had just time to get to the end of her journey before the last Christmas shopping. But all of a sudden, right at the foot of the mountain, puff, chug, squeak, squeak, the engine broke down. The wheel slid along a little farther with a shrieking, wailing cry, and then stood perfectly still. Now how was the train to cross the mountain and get her toys over there in time for the children's Christmas? Rag dolls, paper dolls, china dolls, little worsted dogs with shoe-button eyes and celluloid cats and white fur bunnies and painted wooden horses and noah's arks and dolls houses and dolls furniture and rocking horses and tops and bats and balls and wagons and carts were they all to stay there packed away useless and the children on the other side to go without them for christmas as the little train stood there hoping for help along toward her came a great strong engine all finely cleaned up and black with his number plate scoured and shining he had just finished his work of pulling a fine long passenger train while sleeping cars parlor car and dining car and he was on his way back to the roundhouse now puffing and blowing with pride oh big big engine cried the train and every one of her cars joined in the chorus will you please take us over the mountain our engine is broken down and we're loaded with christmas toys for the children on the other side will you help us help us help us help us but the big passenger engine puffed and snorted and blew off steam angrily it's not my business to pull such a little nobody as you he roared i pull much finer trains than you puff puff ding dong whew and he switched himself round on a side track past the poor little train of cars and soon left her helpless far behind but the little train of cars never left off hoping that someone would come to help her pretty soon there came along another great strong engine that had just pulled a heavy freight train over the mountain and was on his way back to the roundhouse to rest so the little train called out to the freight train and every one of her cars joined in the chorus oh big big engine will you please take us over the mountain our engine is broken down and we're loaded with christmas toys for the children on the other side will you help us help us help us but the big freight engine puffed and snorted more angrily than the other and sent up out of his smokestack a shower of angry sparks i've done enough work for today yes sorry he hissed i've done enough done enough done enough done enough done enough done enough and he switched himself round on the side track past the poor little train of cars and soon left her helpless far behind but the little train of cars never left off hoping that someone would come to help her. Pretty soon there came along a smaller engine, just about the size of the one that had been pulling the train. He looked dingy and rusty and dusty, and he didn't puff at all. He just sighed and groaned and grunted and rumbled and grumbled. But the little train called out to him, and every one of her cars joined in the chorus. Oh, engine, engine, will you please take us over the mountain? Our engine is broken down, and we're loaded with Christmas toys for the children on the other side. Will you help us, help us, help us? 
then the dingy dusty rusty engine groaned and grunted and rumbled and grumbled i never could pull you over the mountain i haven't the strength i never could 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 and he dragged himself round the side track past the poor little train of cars and soon left her helpless far behind still the little train of cars never left off hoping that someone would come to help her after a long long time along came a little small engine it seemed quite useless to ask this little small engine for help yet the little small engine had one very bright lively eye in her head and she was humming and hurrying along whistling and ringing her bell in the very liveliest fashion so the little train cried out and every one of her cars joined in the chorus little engine could you take us over the mountain our engine is broken down and we're loaded with christmas toys for the children on the other side can you help us help us help us now the little small engine had never been far away from the freight yard where she had spent all her days in switching but she did not mean to let those children go without their christmas toys if she could possibly help it so she answered i think i can i think i can i think i can then she came straight up to the train caught hold of her and began to tug and pull pretty soon ding dong ding dong puff 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 chug 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 the train of cars began to move slowly slowly and the little small engine as she toiled kept puffing i think i can i think i can i think i can slowly steadily she gained speed i think i can i think i can i think i can now she ran steadily up the track i think i can 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 at last she reached the top of the mountain and then she puffed out joyously i thought i could there below on the other side lay a great big city the city where the children lived to whom she was bearing the christmas toys down she started sliding faster 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 and as she went she sang merrily i thought i could 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 and so the children got their christmas toys end of section sixty nine recorded by ginger cucolo section seventy of in the nursery of my book house this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by carrie ray clark in the nursery of my book house edited by olive beaupre miller try again by william e hickson try again if you find your task is hard try again time will bring you your reward try again all that other folk can do why with patience may not you only keep this rule in view try again william e hickson end of section seventy recording by carrie ray clark united states section seventy one of in the nursery of my book house this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Terry Dow. In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. Edited by Olive Beaupre Miller. A Quick Running Squash by Alyssa Aspinwall. Charles owned a garden. One morning his father called him and pointing to four stakes driven in the ground, which certainly had not been there the night before, said, All the land within those four stakes is yours, your very own. Charles was delighted, and thanking his dear father, ran off to get his little cart, for he wished at once to build a stone wall about his property. He did not fear it would run away, but he knew that landowners always walled in their possessions. After the wall is built, said his father, you may plant in your garden anything you like, and James will give you what you ask for. 
In two days the wall was built, and a good one it was too, being strong and even. The next day James set out some plants for him, and gave the boy some seeds which he planted himself, James telling him how to do it. He then got his watering pot and gently sprinkled the newly planted ground with warm water. Running across the lawn, he looked down the road to see if his father had not yet come from the village. His father was nowhere to be seen, but coming down the road was a most remarkable-looking man. He was tall and thin and had bright red hair which had evidently not been cut for a very long time. He wore a blue coat, green trousers, red hat, and on his hands, which were large, two very dirty, ragged, white kid gloves. This wonderful man came up to Charles and asked for a drink of water, which he, being a polite boy, at once brought. The man thanked him and then said, "'What have you been doing this morning, little man?' Charles told him about his new garden, and the man listened with much interest. "'Little boy,' said he, "'there is one seed that you have not got.' "'And what is that?' "'The seed of the quick-running squash.' Charles's face fell. "'I don't believe James has that, and I don't know where to get one,' he faltered. "'Now, as it happens,' said the man, "'I have one of those very seeds in my pocket. It is not, however, that of a common everyday quick-running squash. This one came from India, and it is marvellous for its quick-running qualities. You have been kind to me, little boy, and I will give it to you. And with a peculiar smile, this strange man produced from his pocket, instead of the ordinary squash seed, an odd, round, red seed, which he gave to Charles, who thanked him heartily and ran to plant it at once. Having done so, he went back to ask when the quick-running squash would begin to grow. But the man had disappeared and although charles looked up and down the dusty road he could see nothing of him as he stood there he heard behind him a little rustling noise and turning saw coming toward him a green vine he had of course seen vines before but never never had he seen such a queer one as this it was running swiftly towards him and on the very front was a round yellow ball about as big as an orange. Charles, looking back to see where it came from, found that it started in the corner of his garden. And what had he planted in that corner? Why, to be sure, the seed of the quick-running squash, which the strange man had just given him. Well, 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 he shouted in great excitement. What an awfully quick-running squash it is! I suppose that little yellow thing in front is the squash itself. But indeed, it must not run away from me. I must stop it. And he started swiftly down the street after it. But alas, no boy could run as fast as that squash. And Charles saw far ahead the bright yellow ball, now grown to be about the size of an ordinary squash, running and capering merrily over stones, big and little, never turning out for anything, but bobbing up and down, up and down, and waving its long green vine like a tail behind it. The boy ran swiftly on. It shall not get away, he panted. It belongs to me. But that squash did not seem to realize at all. He did not feel that he belonged to anybody, and he did feel that he was a quick-running squash, and so on he scampered. Suddenly he came to a very large rock and stopped for a moment to take a breath, and in that moment Charles caught up with him and simply sat down on him. Now, squash, said he, slapping him on the side, your journey is ended. The words were scarcely spoken when he suddenly felt himself lifted up in the air and bumpity bump over the stone flew the squash, carrying with him his very much astonished little master. The squash had been growing all the time and was now about three times as big as an ordinary one. Charles, who had a pony of his own, knew how to ride, but never had he ridden anything so extraordinary as this. 
On they flew. Roll, waddle, bump, bump. Roll, waddle, bang. The boy digging his knees hard into the sides of the squash to avoid being thrown. He had a dreadfully hard time. Mount to the next quick-running squash you meet, and you will see for yourself how it is. To Charles's great delight, he now saw his father coming toward him, riding his big white horse, Nero, who was very much frightened when he saw the boy on such a strange yellow steed. But Nero soon calmed down at his master's voice, and turning, rode along beside the big squash, although he had to go at full speed to do so. Galopity gallop went Nero, and bumpity bump went the squash. Papa lost his hat. Charles had parted with his long before. "'What are you doing, my son, and what, what is it you are riding?' asked his father. "'A quick running squash, Papa!' gasped Charles, who, although bruised, refused to give up the squash and was still pluckily keeping his seat. "'Stop it! Oh, do stop it, Papa!' His father knew that this could be no ordinary squash, and saw that it evidently did not intend to stop. "'I will try to turn it and make it go back,' he said. So riding Nero nearer and nearer the squash, he forced it up against a stone wall. But instead of going back, this extraordinary squash jumped with scarcely a moment's hesitation over the high wall and went bobbing along into the rough field beyond. But alas, before them was a broad lake, and he could not swim. Back he was forced to turn. Over the wall and back again, over the same road and toward the garden whence he came, Charles still on his back, and Charles's papa galloping at full speed behind. The squash, however, must have had a good heart, for when he reached the house again, he, of his own accord, turned in at the gate and ran up to the wall of Charles's garden. There he stopped, for he was now so big that he could not climb walls, and indeed, had he been able to get in, he would have filled the little garden to overflowing, for he was really enormous. Charles's father had actually to get a ladder for the poor little fellow to climb down, and he was so tired that he had to be carried to the house. But the squash was tired too, dreadfully tired. I suppose it is a very bad thing for a growing squash to take much exercise. This certainly was a growing squash, and there is also no doubt that he had taken a great deal of exercise that morning. Be that as it may, when the family were at luncheon, they were alarmed by hearing a violent explosion near the house. Rushing out to see what could have happened, they found that the marvellous quick-running squash had burst. It lay spread all over the lawn in a thousand pieces. The family, and all the neighbors' families, for miles around, had squash pie for a week. End of section 71 of In the Nursery of My Bookhouse Section 72 of In the Nursery of My Bookhouse this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In the Nursery of My Bookhouse, edited by Olive Bobre Miller. Jack Frost by Gabriel Seton. The door was shut, as door should be, before you went to bed last night. Yet Jack Frost has got in, you see, and left your window silver white. He must have waited till you slept, and not a single word he spoke but penciled all the pains and crept away again before you woke. And now you cannot see the trees, nor fields that stretch beyond the lane, but there are fairer things than these, his fingers traced on every pane. Rocks and castles towering high, hills and dales and streams and fields, and knights in armor riding by, with nodding plumes and shining shields. And here are little boats and there, big ships, with sails spread to the breeze, and yonder palm trees waving fair, on islands set in silver seas, and butterflies with gauzy wings, and herds of cows and flocks of sheep, and fruit and flowers and all the things you see when you are sound asleep. For, creeping softly underneath, the door when all lights are out, Jack Frost takes every breath you breathe, and knows the things you think about. 
He paints them on the window pane in fairy lines with frozen steam, and when you wake, you see again the lovely things you saw in dream. End of Jack Frost, recording by Ellie in May 2012. Section 73 of In the Nursery of My Book House. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Julia Niedermeyer. In the Nursery of My Book House. Edited by Olive Bobre Miller. The Cock, the Mouse, and the Little Red Hen by Felicity Lefebvre. Once upon a time there was a hill and on the hill there was a pretty little house. It had one little green door, and four little windows with green shutters, and in it there lived a cock, and a mouse, and a little red hen. On another hill close by there was another little house. It was very ugly. It had a door that wouldn't shut, and two broken windows, and all the paint was off the shutters. And in this house there lived a bold bad fox, and four bad little foxes. One morning these four bad little foxes came to the big bad fox and said, Oh, father, we are so hungry. We had nothing to eat yesterday, said one, and scarcely anything the day before, said another. The big bad fox shook his head, for he was thinking. At last he said in a big gruff voice, On the hill over there I see a house, and in that house there lives a cock and a mouse screamed two of the little foxes and the little red hen screamed the other two and they are nice and fat went on the big bad fox this very day i'll take my sack and i will go up that hill and in at the door and into my sack i will put the cock and the mouse and the little red hen so the four little foxes jumped for joy and the big bad fox went to get his sack ready to start upon his journey but what was happening to the cock and the mouse and the little red hen all this time well sad to say the cock and the mouse had both got out of bed on the wrong side that morning the cock said that the day was too hot and the mouse grumbled because it was too cold they came grumbling down the kitchen where the good little red hen looking as bright as a sunbeam was bustling about who'll get some sticks to light the fire with she asked i shan't said the cock i shan't said the mouse then i'll do it myself said the little red hen so off she ran to get the sticks and now who'll fill the kettle from the spring she asked i shan't said the cock i shan't said the mouse then i'll do it myself said little red hen and off she ran to fill the kettle and who'll get the breakfast ready she asked as she put the kettle on to boil i shan't said the cock i shan't said the mouse i'll do it myself said the little red hen all breakfast time the cock and the mouse quarrelled and grumbled the cock upset the milk jug and the mouse scattered crumbs upon the floor who clear away the breakfast asked the poor little red hen hoping they would soon leave off being cross i shan't said the cock i shan't said the mouse then i'll do it myself said the little red hen so she cleared everything away swept up the crumbs and brushed up the fireplace and now who'll help me to make the beds i shan't said the cock i shan't said the mouse then i'll do it myself said the little red hen and she tripped away upstairs but the lazy cock and mouse each sat down in a comfortable armchair by the fire and soon fell fast asleep. Now the bad fox had crept up the hill and into the garden, and if the cock and the mouse hadn't been asleep, they would have seen his sharp eyes peeping at the window. rat a tat rat a tat the fox knocked at the door. Who can that be? said the mouse, half opening his eyes. Go and look for yourself if you want to know, said the rude cock. It's the postman, perhaps, thought the mouse to himself, and he may have a letter for me. So, without waiting to see who it was, he lifted the latch and opened the door. As soon as he opened it, in jumped the big fox. Oh, 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 squeaked the mouse, 
as he tried to run up the chimney. Doodle doodle do screamed the cock as he jumped on the back of the biggest armchair. But the fox only laughed, and without more ado he took the little mouse by the tail and popped him into the sack and seized the cock by the neck and popped him in too. Then the poor little red hen came running downstairs to see what all the noise was about, and the fox caught her and put her into the sack with the others. Then he took a long piece of string out of his pocket, wound it round and round and round the mouth of the sack, and tied it very tight indeed. After that he threw the sack over his back, and off he sat down the hill, chuckling to himself. Oh, I wish I hadn't been so cross, said the cock, as they were bumping about. Oh, I wish I hadn't been so lazy, said the mouse, wiping his eyes with the tip of his tail. It's never too late to mend, said little red hen and don't be too sad. See, here I have my little work bag, and in it there is a pair of scissors, and a little thimble, and a needle, and thread. Very soon you will see what I am going to do. Now the sun was very hot, and soon Mr. Fox began to feel his sack was heavy, and at last he thought he would lie down under a tree and go to sleep for a little while. So he threw the sack down with a big bump, and very soon fell fast asleep. Snore! snore snore went the fox as soon as the little red hen heard this she took out her scissors and began to snip a hole in the sack just large enough for the mouse to creep through quick she whispered to the mouse run as fast as you can and bring back a stone just as large as yourself out scampered the mouse and soon came back dragging the stone after him push it in here said little red hen and he pushed it in in a twinkling then the little red hen snipped away at the hole till it was large enough for the cock to go through quick she said run and get a stone as big as yourself out flew the cock and soon came back quite out of breath with a big stone which he pushed into the sack too then the little red hen popped out got the stone as big as herself and pushed it in next she put on the thimble took out her needle and thread and sewed up the hole as quickly as ever she could when it was done the cock and the mouse and the little red hen ran home very fast, shut the door after them, drew the bolts, shut the shutters, and drew down the blinds and felt quite safe. The bad fox lay fast asleep under the tree for some time, but at last he awoke. Dear, dear, he said, rubbing his eyes and then looking at the long shadows on the grass. How late it is getting. I must hurry home. So the bad fox went crumbling and croning down the hill till he came to the stream splash in went one foot splash in went the other but the stones in the sack were so heavy that at the very next step down tumbled mr fox into a deep pool and then the fishes carried him off to their fairy caves and kept him a prisoner there so he was never seen again and the four greedy little foxes had to go to bed without any supper but the cock and the mouse never crumbled again they lit the fire filled the kettle laid the breakfast and did all the work while the good little red hen had a holiday and sat resting in the big armchair no foxes ever troubled them again and for all i know they are still living happily in the little house with the green door and green shutters which stands on the hill end of section seventy three recorded by julia niedermeyer vienna austria Section number 74 of In the Nursery of My Book House. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Candace Stalick, Dallas, Texas. In the Nursery of My Book House. Edited by Olive Bepure Miller. Baby Seed Song by Edith Nesbitt. Little brown seed, oh, little brown brother, are you awake in the dark? Here we lie cozily, close to each other. Hark to the song of the lark. Waken, the lark says, waken and dress you. Put on your green coats and gay. Blue sky will shine on you, sunshine caress you. Waken, tis morning, tis May little brown brother oh little brown brother what kind of flower will you be i'll be a poppy all white like my mother 
do be a poppy like me what you're a sunflower how shall i miss you when you're grown golden and high but i shall send all the bees up to kiss you little brown brother good-bye end of section seventy four of in the nursery of my bookhouse this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by candace stellick dallas texas section seventy five of in the nursery of my bookhouse this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by capricia page in the nursery of my bookhouse edited by olive beaupre miller the turtle who could not stop talking an east indian fable once there was a turtle who lived in a muddy little pond and he loved to crawl out in the sun and talk to everyone who went by he talked to the beasts and he talked to the birds and he talked to the fishes he talked to the wild geese as they flew by on their way to the south every year and he talked to the little brown children who lived in the village nearby in fact he was always talking he talked and he talked and he talked he chattered and chattered and chattered one fine day there came into his muddy little pond two young wild geese who had flown on their strong wings a long long way friend turtle said the geese as they rested beside him on the water we have a beautiful home far away a shining blue pond as clear as glass with nodding green grasses round about we are on our way there now it's a far pleasanter place than this how would you like to come with us the turtle looked about at his muddy little pond he had always longed to go south and he wanted so much to see that shining blue pool with the nodding green grasses round about but he answered how can i go with you i have no wings oh we will take you if only you can keep your mouth closed and say not a word to any one said the geese oh of course i can keep my mouth closed said the turtle do take me with you i will do exactly as you say so the next day the geese brought a stick each one holding an end of it in his bill now take hold of the middle of this stick with your mouth said they and so we will lift you up in the air but don't say a word until we reach home for if you do you will lose your hold and fall to the ground of course i will do exactly as you say said the turtle so the turtle took hold of the stick with his mouth and the geese soared up with him between them above the green tops of the tall palm trees up up into the blue sky they flew but as they passed over the village they came down near enough to the earth so the little brown children below could just see their old friend the turtle oh look at the turtle the children cried yes I'm going on a long, long journey, farther than any of you have ever been, the turtle wanted to say, but he remembered just in time and did not open his mouth. Look, those geese are carrying him on a stick. Did you ever in all your life see anything so silly? cried the children. Silly yourself. What business is it of yours how I'm carried? the turtle wanted to say but he remembered just in time and did not open his mouth oh ha ha cried the children how does he ever keep his mouth closed do you suppose he can really and truly stop talking this was too much for the turtle of course i can stop talking he cried 
and at once he lost his hold on the stick and fell down crash at their feet poor little turtle said the children he fell because he could not stop talking a bit pie fable adapted from the sanskrit end of section 75 recording by capricia page Section 76 of In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Capricia Page. In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. Edited by Olive Beaupre Miller. White Butterflies by Algernon Charles Swinburne. Fly, white butterflies, out to sea, frail, pale wings, for the wind to try, small white wings that we scarce can see, fly. Some fly light as a laugh of glee, some fly soft as a long low sigh, all to the haven where each would be fly end of section 76 recording by capricia page section 77 of in the nursery of my bookhouse this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rahimus Holmes. In the Nursery of My Bookhouse, edited by Olive Bupri Miller. Grasshopper Green. Grasshopper Green is a comical chap. He lives on the best of fare. Bright little trousers, jacket, and cap. These are his summer wear. Out in the meadow, he loves to go, playing away in the sun. It's hopperty, skipperty, high and low. Summer's the time for fun. Grasshopper Green has a dozen wee boys, and soon as her legs grow strong, each of them joins in his frolicsome joys, singing his merry song. Under the hedge, in a happy row, Soon as the day has begun, it's hopperty skippity high and low. Summer's the time for fun. Grasshopper Green has a quaint little house. It's under the hedge so gay. Grandmother Spider, as still as a mouse, watches him over the way. Gladly he's calling the children, I know, out in the beautiful sun. It's hopperty skippity high and low. Summer's the time for fun. End of section 77. Section number 78 of In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jill Janovitz. In the Nursery of My Bookhouse, edited by Olive Bupri Miller. Mother Spider by Francis Bliss Gillespie. It was a beautiful day in midsummer. The meadow was alive with busy little people astir in the bright sunlight. A long line of ants came crawling down the path, carrying provisions to their home under the elm tree and an old toad came hopping down through the grass, blinking in the warm sun. Just a little higher up, the bees were droning drowsily as they flew from flower to flower, and above them all, seeming almost in the blue sky, a robin was calling to his mate. Pretty soon, Mrs. Spider came down the path. She seemed to be in a great hurry. 
she looked neither to the right nor to the left, but kept straight ahead, holding tightly to a little white bag which she carried in her mouth. She was just rushing past Mr. Toad when a big black beetle came bumping by, stumbled against Mrs. Spider, and knocked the bag out of her mouth. In an instant, Mrs. Spider pounced down upon him, and though he was so much bigger than she, he tumbled over on his back. While he was trying to kick himself right side up once more, Mrs. Spider made a quick little dash, took up her bag, and scuttled off through the grass. Well, I never, said Grasshopper Green, who was playing seesaw on a blade of grass. No, nor I, grumbled Mr. Beetle, as he wiggled back to his feet. I didn't want her bag. She needn't have made such a fuss. She must have had something very fine in that bag, said Grasshopper Green, for she was so frightened when she dropped it. I wonder what it was. And he balanced himself on his grass blade until a stray breeze blew him off, and then he straight away forgot about Mrs. Spider altogether. Two weeks after this, Grasshopper Green started out for a little exercise before breakfast. Just as they reached the edge of the brook, he saw Mrs. Spider coming toward him. She was moving quite slowly and no longer carried the little white bag. As she came nearer, he could see that she had something on her back. Good morning, neighbor, called Grasshopper Green. Can I help you carry your things? Thank you, she said, but they wouldn't stay with you, even if they could stay on when you give such great jumps. They? said Grasshopper Green. And then, as he came nearer, he saw that the things on Mrs. Spider's back were wee little baby spiders. Aren't they pretty children? she asked proudly. I was so afraid that something would happen to my eggs that I never let go of the bag once, except when that stupid Mr. Beetle knocked it out of my mouth. Oh, said Grasshopper Green, so that was what frightened you so. Your bag was full of eggs, and now you are going to carry all those children on your back? Doesn't it tire you dreadfully? I don't mind that a bit, said Mrs. Spider. If only the children are well and safe. In a little while, you know, they will be able to run about by themselves, and then we shall be so happy here in the meadow grass. Oh, it's worth the trouble, neighbor Grasshopper. Yes, said Grasshopper Green, I have a dozen wee boys of my own at home, and that reminds me that it is time to go home to breakfast. Goodbye, neighbor. I hope the children will soon be running about with you. You certainly are taking good care of them. Goodbye. Then home he went, and proud, happy Mother Spider kept on her way to hunt for a breakfast for the babies she loved so well. Cobwebs, dainty fairy lacework, oh, so finely spun, lying on the grasses and shining in the sun. Guess the fairies washed you and spread you out to dry and left you there a glistening and a shining to the sky. End of section 78 Mother Spider Section 79 of In the Nursery of My Book House. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Capricia Page. In the Nursery of My Book House. Edited by Olive Beaupre Miller. Where Go the Boats? By Robert Louis Stevenson. Dark brown is the river, gold is the sand. It flows along forever with trees on either hand. Green leaves a floating, castles of the foam, boats of mine a boating. When will all come home? On goes the river and out past the mill, away down the valley. 
away down the hill. Away down the river, a hundred miles or more, other little children shall bring my boats ashore. End of section 79 Recording by Capricia Page Section 80 of In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tara Dow. In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. Edited by Olive Beaupre Miller. Paper Boats by Rabindranath Tagore. Day by day I float my paper boats one by one, down the running streams. In big black letters I write my name on them and the name of the village where I live. I hope that someone in some strange land will find them and know who I am. I load my little boats with shiuli flowers from our garden and hope that these blooms of the dawn will be carried safely to land in the night. I launch my paper boats and look up into the sky and see the little clouds setting their white, bulging sails. I know not what playmate of mine in the sky sends them down the air to race with my boats. When night comes, I bury my face in my arms and dream that my paper boats float on and on under the midnight stars. The fairies of sleep are sailing in them and the ladding is their baskets full of dreams. End of section 80 of In the Nursery of My Bookhouse Section 81 of In the Nursery of My Bookhouse This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In the Nursery of My Bookhouse, edited by Olive Bowbury Miller. The Moo Cow Moo by Edmund Vance Cook. My pa held me up to the Moo Cow Moo, so close I could almost touch. And I fed him a couple of times or two, and I wasn't afraid, Cat, much. But ef my papa goes into the house, and mamma she goes in too, I just keep still like a little mouse, for the Moo Cow Moo might moo. The moo cow moo's got a tail like a rope, and it's raveled down where it grows, and it's just like feeling a piece of soap all over the moo cow's nose. And the moo cow moo has lots of fun just swinging his tail about, and he opens his mouth, and then I run, cause that's where the moo comes out. And the moo cow moo's got deers on his head, and his eyes stick out of their place, and the nose of the moo cow moo is spread all over the end of his face. End of section 81. Read by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org, in May 2012, in San Diego, California. Section 82 of In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In the Nursery of My Bookhouse, edited by Olive Bowbury Miller. The Wee Wee Manny and the Big Big Coo, a Scotch folk tale. Once upon a time, when all wee folks were big folks, and all big folks were wee folks, there was a wee wee Manny, and he had a big big coo. Out he went to milk her of a morning. But the big, big coo kicked up her heels and would not stand still. "'Hoot! Look at that now,' said the wee-wee manny. "'What's a wee-wee manny to do with such a big, contrary coo?' So off he went to his mother at the house. "'Mither,' said he, "'coo won't stand still, and wee-wee manny can't milk big, big coo.' "'Hoot!' says his mother. "'Go tell big, big coo she must stand still.' So off he went to the big, big coo, and said, "'Big coo canna have her way. She must stand still. She must, I say.' 
but the big, big coo kicked up her heels and swished her tail and would not stand still. So back went the manny to the house and said, Mither, I've told big, big coo she must, but she will not, and wee, wee manny can't milk big, big coo. Hoot, says his mother, go get a stout, stout stick and shake it at big, big coo. So off he went and got a stout, stout stick. Then he shook stout, stout stick at coo and said, Big, big coo, you must stand still, or my stout stick I'll make you feel. But the big, big coo kicked up her heels, swished her tail, tossed her head, and would not stand still. So back went the wee, wee manny to the house, and said, Mither, I've told big, big coo she must. I've shaken stout, stout stick at her, but she will not stand still, and wee, wee manny can't milk big, big coo. Hoot, says his mother. Go to the drapers, and get ye a gown of silk, for to coax big, big coo. So off he went to the drapers, and bought a gown of silk. Then he spread out the gown of silk before big, big coo, and said, Hold still, my coo, my dearie, and fill my bucket with milk, and if ye'll not be contrary, I'll gie ye a gown of silk. But the big, big coo kicked up her heels, swished her tail, tossed her head, lowered her horns, and would not stand still. So back went the manny to the house, and said, Mither, I've told big, big coo she must. I've shaken stout, stout stick at her. I've coaxed her wi' a gown o' silk. But she will not stand still, and wee, wee manny can't milk big, big coo. Hoot, says his mother. Then go to coo, and soften her hard, hard heart. Tell her there's a sweet, sweet lady wi' yellow hair by the roadside, and she's weary wi' walkin' and weepin' for a sup o' milk. So off he went to Coo and said, "'There's a lady by the roadside, wi' long and golden hair. "'She's wearied out wi' walkin', and weeps a-sittin' there. "'Twould make ye weep in buckets, if ye were just to think. "'She's weepin', 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 for a drop o' milk to drink.' "'But the big, big Coo wept no tears in buckets for the lady by the roadside. "'She kicked up her heels, swished her tail, tossed her head, lowered her horns, bellowed out loudly, Moo! Moo! and would not stand still. So back to the house went the manny, and said, Mither, I've told big, big coo she must. I've shaken stout, stout stick at her. I've coaxed her wi' a gown o' silk. I've tried to make her soft a heart for the lady by the roadside, but she will not stand still, and wee, wee manny can't milk big, big coo. Well then, says his mother, Go to that coo and tell her she must not stand still. Bid her kick up her heels, swish her tail, toss her head, lower her horns, and bellow out loudly, Moo! Moo! If she be such a contrary beastie, she'll do what she thinks you don't want her to do. So off he went to Big Big Coo and said, Coo, ye dare na stand there still. Kick and rare, tis what I will. Never dare to stand, I say. I bid ye kick and rare all day. When she heard that, the big, big coo stood still, still, still. Heels, tail, head, horns, voice, all still. Then the wee, wee manny milked the big, big coo for the sweet, sweet lady with the yellow hair, and the big, big coo never, never, never acted like that again till the next time. End of section 82. Read by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org, in May 2012, in San Diego, California. Section 83 of In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rahimus Holmes. In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. Edited by Olive Bupre Miller. The Purple Cow by Gillette Burgess. I never saw a purple cow. I never hoped to see one. But I can tell you, anyhow, I'd rather see than be one. End of section 83.
Section 84 of In the Nursery of My Book House The Little Girl and the Hare, a German folk tale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Little Girl and the Hare, a German folk tale. There once was a woman who lived with her little girl in a pretty garden that had cabbages in it. A little hare came into the garden and ate the cabbages. Then the mother said to the little girl, Go into the garden and chase the hare away. So the little girl said to the hare, Shoo, shoo, you little hare. You're eating up all our cabbages, said the hare. Come, little girl, and sit thyself. Come, little girl, and sit thyself on my little hare's tail and come with me to my little hare's house. But the little girl would not do it. The next day the hare came again and ate the cabbages. Then the mother said to the little girl, Go into the garden and drive the hare away. So the little girl said to the hare, Shoo, shoo, little hare, you are eating all our cabbages. You are eating all our cabbages, said the hare. Come, little girl, and sit thyself on my little hare's tail and go with me to my little hare's house. But the little girl would not go. On the third day, the hare came again and ate the cabbages. At this, the mother said to the little girl as before, Go into the garden and drive the hare away. So the little girl said to the hare, Shoo, shoo, little hare, you are still eating all our cabbages, said the hare. Come, little girl, and sit thyself on my little hare's tail, and go with me to my little hare's house. So the little girl seated herself on the little hare's tail, and then the little hare took her far, far away to his little hare's house. When he reached there, he said, Now you shall stay here and cook green cabbage and beans for me in the pot by the fire. I will ask some friends to come and make merry with us. The guests all came together. There were hares and a crow and a fox, and they stood out under the rainbow, waiting to be led in to the little hare's house. But the little girl was sad, for she wanted to see her mother. The little hare came to her and said, Open the doors, open the doors, our guests are merry. The little girl said nothing, but she began to cry. The little hare went away, and then the little hare came back again and said, Take off the lid to the pot. Take off the lid. The guests are hungry. The little girl said nothing, but went on crying. The little hare went away, and then the little hare came back again and said, Take off the lid. Take off the lid. The guests are waiting. The little girl said nothing, but went on crying. The little hare went away. Then the little hare came back again and said, Take off the lid. Take off the lid. The guests are waiting. The little girl said nothing. But when the hare went away again, she made a doll out of straw and dressed it up in her own clothes, gave it a spoon to stir with, and set it before the pot, then ran back home to her mother. The little hare came once more and said, Take off the lid! Take off the lid! But when the little girl did not take off the lid, the little hare went up to see what was the matter. Then he poked the doll by the pot. Over it fell, its cap rolled off, and the little hare saw it was nothing but straw. So he had to let his friends in and feed them all by himself. Adapted from William and Jacob Grimm. End of section 84. Section 85 of In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lyman Hopper. In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. Edited by Olive Bupre Miller. The Ass in the Lion Skin. An ass once found a lion skin, which had been left out in the sun to dry. Aha, he said to himself. It will be much finer to make believe I'm a lion than to go about just a donkey. So he dressed himself up in the lion skin and went back toward the village where he lived. Soon, on the country roads, he began to meet the people of the town. Seeing him come lumbering toward them, they thought him truly a lion, and all ran away from him as fast as their legs could go. Some were carrying great bundles on their heads, but they turned around and ran their bundles falling this way and that. Some were driving wagons or carts, but they sprang to the ground with a shriek, left everything, and fled. Then the oxen and horses reared up in the air, waving their forelegs wildly, turned square around, 
and ran away too, with the wagons tipping and tilting behind them. Men, women, children, dogs, horses, cats, oxen, sheep, and even the pigs all kicked up their heels and fell over each other, shrieking, barking, bellowing, squealing, they ran up the dusty road. Proud was the ass that day. He crouched like a lion. He sprang. He chased. What sport he was having. Almost he thought he was really a lion. But at last, wishing to seem even more like the king of beasts, he said to himself, I'll roar, and I'll roar, and I'll roar. Then they'll think I'm the fiercest lion that ever came out of the forest. I'll have my own way in the village and drive men and beasts wherever I choose. So he lifted up his voice with all its strength. But alas, instead of roaring, he let out a loud, ridiculous bray. Ee-haw! 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 The people stopped running away at once. Why, he's only an ass in a lion's skin, they cried, and they picked up sticks and ran after him. Then it was his turn to kick up his heels and run. But it was all of no use. He could not get away. The people whom he had tricked caught him and held him, using their sticks on his back until his master came up. Then his master turned him out of the lion skin in a twinkling, and amid the jeers of all, led him back to his proper business of carrying loads. Shortly afterwards, a fox came up to the ass and said, Ah, you gave away the secret of who you were by your voice. He who pretends to be something he is not, will always, sooner or later, give away the truth. End of chapter 85. Recording by Lyman Hopper. Section 86 of In the Nursery of My Book House. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rebecca, www.bluebird-experience.com. In the Nursery of My Bookhouse, edited by Olive Beaupre Miller, Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Once upon a time, there were three bears who lived in a little house of their own in a wood. There was a great huge bear who was the father bear, a middle-sized bear who was the mother bear, and a tiny wee bear who was the baby bear. They had each a pot for their porridge, a little pot for the tiny wee bear, a middle-sized pot for the middle-sized bear, and a great huge pot for the great huge bear. One morning, the three bears found their porridge was too hot. So they left it to cool in their porridge pots and went for a walk in the woods. While they were gone, a little girl came along. She was called Goldilocks because her hair shone like gold, and she too was out for a walk in the woods. I wonder who lives here, she said to herself as she saw the funny little house. She knocked and she knocked and she knocked, but nobody came. Then without ever stopping to think that she had no business to enter where she was not invited, she opened the door and peeped in. There on the table were the three pots of porridge, the great huge pot, the middle-sized pot, and the tiny wee pot. Goldilocks tasted the porridge in the great huge pot, but it was too hot. So she tasted the porridge in the middle-sized pot, but that was too cold. Then she tasted the porridge in the tiny wee pot, and that was just right. So she ate it all up. Now in the room she saw three chairs. A great huge chair, a middle-sized chair, and a tiny wee chair. So Goldilocks sat down in the great huge chair, but that was too hard. Then she sat down in the middle-sized chair, but that was too soft. So she tried the tiny wee chair, and that was just right. But no sooner had she gotten quite comfortable than there was a crash and a bang. The tiny wee chair broke into tiny wee pieces and spilled Goldilocks on the floor. So Goldilocks went into the bedroom. 
There she saw a great huge bed, a middle-sized bed, and a tiny wee bed. First she lay down on the great huge bed, but that was too hard. Then she lay down on the middle-sized bed, but that was too soft. At last she lay down on the tiny wee bed, and that was just right. So Goldilocks curled up under the covers and fell fast asleep. After a while, along came the three bears who lived in the house. The great huge bear who was the father bear, the middle-sized bear who was the mother bear, and the tiny wee bear who was the baby bear. When the great huge bear saw his pot, he roared in his rough, gruff voice, Who has been tasting my porridge? When the middle-sized bear saw her pot, she cried out in her middle-sized voice, Who has been tasting my porridge? And when the tiny wee bear saw his pot, he squealed in his tiny wee voice, Who has been tasting my porridge and eaten it all up? When the great huge bear saw his chair, with the cushion all flattened down, he roared in his rough, gruff voice, Who has been sitting in my chair? And the middle-sized bear, when she saw the cushion all flattened down on her chair, cried in her middle-sized voice, Who has been sitting in my chair? And when the tiny wee bear, when he saw what had happened to his chair, squealed in his tiny wee voice, Who has been sitting in my chair and broken it all to pieces? So they went into the bedroom, and when the great huge bear saw his bed with the covers all crumpled up, he roared in his rough, gruff voice, Who has been lying on my bed? And the middle-sized bear, when she saw her bed with the covers all crumpled up, cried in her middle-sized voice, Who has been lying on my bed? And the tiny wee bear, when he looked at his bed, squealed in his tiny wee voice, Here she is! Here she is! Fast asleep in my little bed! His voice woke Goldilocks up and she opened her eyes. Grrr! growled the great huge bear in his rough, gruff voice. Grrr! growled the middle-sized bear in her middle-sized voice. growled the tiny wee bear in his tiny wee voice. When Goldilocks heard them all growling around her, she was very sorry indeed that she hadn't stopped to think before she entered their house and meddled with their things. Before you could say, Jack Robinson, she jumped out of bed, rushed to the window, climbed out, and ran back home as fast as her legs would carry her. End of section 86 Recording by Rebecca Section 87 of In the Nursery of My Book House. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In the Nursery of My Book House, edited by Olive Bobri Miller. Mary Had a Little Lamp by Sarah Josepha Hall. Mary had a little lamp, its fleece was white as snow, and everywhere that Mary went, the lamp was sure to go. It followed her to school one day, it was against the rule, and made the children laugh and play, to see a lamp at school. And so the teacher turned him out, but still he lingered near, and waited patiently about, till Mary did appear. What makes the lamp love Mary so, the eager children cry, why Mary loves her lamp, you know, the teacher did reply. End of section 87, recording by Ellie, June 2012. Section 88 of In the Nursery of My Book House. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by A Quiet Girl. In a Nursery of My Book House. Edited by Olive Beaupre Miller. The Twin Lambs. By Clara Dillingham Pearson. There was a lamb, a bright, frisky young fellow, who had a twin sister. Their mother loved them both, and was as kind to one as to the other, 
but the brother wanted to have the best of everything, and sometimes he even bunted his sister with his hard little forehead. His mother had to speak to him many times about this, for he was one of the strange children who will not mind when first spoken to. He did not really mean to be naughty, he was only strong and frisky and thoughtless. Sometimes he was even rude to his mother. She felt very sad when this was so, yet she loved him dearly and found many excuses for him in her own heart. There were three other pairs of twins in the flock that year, and as their mothers were not strong enough to care for two lambs apiece, the farmer had taken one twin from each pair to a little pen near the house. Here they stayed, playing happily together and drinking milk from a bottle which the farmer's wife brought to them. They were hungry very often, like all young children, and when their stomachs began to feel empty, they crowded against the side of the pen, pushed their pinkish-white noses through the openings between the boards, and bleated and bleated and bleated to the farmer's wife. Soon she would come from the kitchen door, and in her hand would bring the big bottle full of milk for them. There was a soft rubber top to this bottle, through which the lambs could draw the milk into their mouths. Of course, they all wanted to drink at once, though there was a chance only for one, and the other always became impatient while they were waiting. The farmer's wife was patient, even when the lambs, in a hurry to get the milk, took her fingers into their mouths and bit them instead of the top of the bottle. A twin lamb wanted to have his sister taken into the pen with the other three, and he spoke about it to his mother. I know how you can manage, said he. Whenever she comes near you, just walk away from her, and then the farmer will take her up to the pen. You selfish fellow, answered his mother. Do you want your dear little twin sister to leave us? He hung his head for a minute, but replied, she'd have just as good a time. They have all they can eat up there, and they have lots of fun. If you think it is so pleasant in the pen, said his mother, suppose I begin to walk away from you, and let the farmer take you away. I think your sister would rather stay with me. Oh no, cried the son, I don't want to leave my own dear woolly mother. I want to cuddle up to you every night and have you tell me stories about the stars. Do you think you love me very much? said she. You don't know how really to love yet, for you are selfish, and there is not room in a selfish heart for the best kind of love. That made the lamb feel very bad. I do love her dearly, he cried, as he stood alone. I believe I love her ever so much more than my sister does. That was where the little fellow was mistaken, for although his sister did not talk so much about it, she showed her love in many other ways. If she had been taken from her mother for even a few days, they could never again have had such sweet and happy days together. Sheep look much alike, and they cannot remember each other's faces very long. If a lamb is taken away from his mother for even a short time, they do not know each other when they meet afterward. Perhaps this is one reason why they keep together so much, for it would be sad indeed not to know one's mother or one's child. His sister never knew that he had wanted her taken away. She thought he acted queerly sometimes, but she was so loving and unselfish herself that she did not dream of his selfishness. Instead of putting the idea out of his woolly little head, as he could have done by thinking more of other things, the brother let himself think of it more and more. That made him impatient even with his mother, and he often answered her quite crossly. Sometimes, when she spoke to him, he did not answer, and that was just as bad. His mother would sigh and say to herself, My child is not a comfort to me after all. Yet, when I looked for the first time into his dear little face, I thought that as long as I had him beside me, I should always be happy. One night, while the weather was fair and warm, the farmer drove all the sheep and lambs into the sheep shed. They had been lying out under the beautiful blue sky at night, and they did not like this nearly so well. They did not understand it either, so they were frightened and bewildered, and bleated often to each other. What is this for? What is this for? The lambs did not mind it so much, for they were not warmly dressed, but the sheep, whose wool had been growing for a year and was long and heavy, found it very close and uncomfortable. They did not know that the farmer had a reason for keeping them dry at night while the heavy dew was falling outside. The same thing was done every year, 
but they could not remember as long as that. Stay close to me, children, said the mother of the twins. I may forget how you look if you're away long. It seems to me, said the brother, that we always have to stay close to you and never have a bit of fun. When they had cuddled down for the night, the twin lambs slept soundly. Their mother lay awake for a long, long time in the dark, and she was not happy. A few careless words from a selfish little lamb had made her heart ache. They were not true words either, for during daytime her children ran with their playmates and had fried and frolics. Still, we know that when people are out of patience, they often say things that are not really so. In the morning, men came into the barn, which opened off the sheep shed. They had on coarse old clothing and carried queer-looking shears in their hands. The sheep could see them now and then when the door was open. Once the farmer stood in the doorway and seemed to be counting them. This made them huddle together more closely than ever. They could see the men carrying clean yellow straw into the barn and spreading it on the floor. On top of this was stretched a great sheet of clean cloth. The men began to come into the shed and catch the sheep and carry them into the barn. They were frightened and bleated a good deal, but when one was caught and carried away, although he might struggle harder to free himself, he did not open his mouth. The old weather sheep was the first to be taken, and then the young ones who had been lambs the year before. For a long time not one of the mothers was chosen. Still, nobody knew what would happen next, and so the fewer sheep there were left, the more closely they huddled together. At last, when the young sheep had all been taken, one of the men caught the mother of the twins and carried her away. She turned her face toward her children, but the door swung shut after her, and they were left with the other lambs and their mothers. From the barn came the sound of snip snip snipping and a murmur of men's voices. Once the twins thought they saw their mother lying on the floor and a man kneeling beside her, holding her head and four legs under his arm, yet they were not sure of this. The brother ran to the corner of the shed and put his head against the boards. He suddenly felt very young and helpless. My dear woolly mother, he said to himself over and over, and he wondered if he would ever see her again. He remembered what he had said to her the night before. It seemed to him that he could even now hear his own voice saying crossly, Seems to me we always have to stay close to you. I never have a bit of fun. He wished he had not said it. He knew she was a dear mother, and he would have given anything in the world for a chance to stay close to her again. His sister felt as lonely and frightened as he, but she did not act in the same way. She stood close to a younger lamb whose mother had just been taken away, and tried to comfort her. One by one the mothers were taken until only the lambs remained. They were very hungry now, and bleated pitifully. Still the twin brother stood with his head in the corner. He had closed his eyes, but now he opened them, and through a crack in the wall of the shed he saw some very slender and white-looking sheep turned into the meadow. At first they acted dizzy and staggered instead of walking straight. Then they stopped staggering and began to frisk. Can it be? said he. It surely is. For although he had never in his short life seen a newly shorn sheep, he began to understand what had happened. He knew that the men had only been clipping the long wool from the sheep, and that they were now ready for warm weather. No wonder they frisked when their heavy burdens of wool were carefully taken off. Now the farmer opened the door into the barn again, and let the lambs walk through it to the gate of the meadow. They had never before been inside this barn, and a twin brother looked quickly around as he scampered across the floor. He saw some great ragged bundles of wool, and a man was just rolling up the last fleece. He wondered if that had been taken from his mother and was the very one against which he had cuddled when he was cold. When they first reached the pasture, the lambs could not tell which were their mothers. Shearing off their long and dingy fleeces had made such a difference in their looks. The twin brother knew his mother by her walking and her voice, but he could see that his sister did not know her at all. He saw his mother wandering around as though she did not know where to find her children, and a naughty plan came into his head. If he could keep his sister from finding their mother for even a short time, he knew that the farmer would take her off to the pen. He thought he knew just how to do it, and he started to run to her. Then he stopped, 
and remembered how sad and lonely he had been without his mother only a little while before, and he began to pity the lambs in the pen. Now his selfishness and his goodness were fighting hard in him. One said, Send your sister away, and the other, Take it to your mother. At last he ran as fast as he could toward his sister. I am good now, he said to himself, but it may not last long. I will tell her before I am naughty again. Oh, sister, cried he, come with me to our mother. She doesn't know where to find us. He saw a happy look on his sister's sad little face, and he was glad that he had done the right thing. They skipped away together, kicking up their heels as they went, and it seemed to the brother that he had never been so happy in his life. He was soon to be happier, though, for when they reached his new white mother, as he called her, and his sister told her how he had shown her the way, his mother said, Now you are a comfort to me. You will be a happier lamb, too, for you know that a mother's heart is large enough for all her children, and that the more one loves, the better he loves. Why, of course, said the twin sister. What do you mean? But the mother never told her, and the brother never told her, and it is hoped that you will keep the secret. End of section 88. The Twin Lambs. Section 89 of In the Nursery of My Book House. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In the Nursery of My Book House, edited by Olive Beaupre Miller. The Swing by Robert Louis Stevenson. How do you like to go up in a swing, up in the air so blue? Oh, I do think it the pleasantest thing ever a child can do. Up in the air and over the wall, till I can see so wide, rivers and trees and cattle and all, over the countryside. Till I look down on the garden green, down on the roof so brown. Up in the air I go flying again, up in the air and down. End of section 89. Read by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org, in May 2012, in San Diego, California. Section 90 of In the Nursery of My Book House. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In the Nursery of My Book House. Edited by Olive Bobre Miller. Whiskey Frisky. Whiskey Frisky, hippity hop, up he goes to the tree top. Whirly twirly, round and round, down his campus to the ground. Furly curly, what a tail, tall as a feather, broad as a sail. Where's his supper? In the shell, snappy, cracky, out it fell. End of section 90. Recording by Ellie in June 2012. Section 91 of In the Nursery of My Book House. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Donna Winters. In the Nursery of My Book House. Edited by Oli Bupre Miller. The Squirrels That Live in a House by Harriet be her stall. Once upon a time, a gentleman went out in a great forest and cut away the trees and built there a very nice little cottage. It was set very low on the ground and had very large bow windows and so much of it was glass that one could look through it on every side and see what was going on in the forest. You could see the shadows of the fern leaves as they flicker and wave over the ground and the scarlet partridge berry and wintergreen plants that matted round the roots of the trees, and the bright spots of sunshine that fell through their branches and went dancing about among the bushes and leaves at their roots. You could see the little chipping sparrows and thrushes and robins and bluebirds building their nests here and there among the branches, and watch them from day to day as they lay their eggs and hatch their young. You could also see red squirrels and gray squirrels and little striped chip squirrels 
darting and sprinting about, here and there and everywhere, running races with each other from bow to bow, and chattering at each other in the greatest possible manner. You may be sure that such a strange thing as a great house for human beings to live in did not come into the wildwood without making quite a stir and excitement about the inhabitants that lived there before. All the time it was building, there was the greatest possible commotion in the breast of all the older population, and there wasn't even a black ant or cricket that did not have his own opinion about it, and did not tell the other ants and crickets just what he thought. Depend upon it, children, said old Mrs. Rabbit to her long eared family. No good will come to us from this. Where man is, there comes always trouble for us poor rabbits. The old chestnut tree that grew on the edge of the woodland ravine drew a great sigh which shook all its leaves. The squirrels talked together of the dreadful state of things. In our forest, said the old chestnut tree, how peacefully, how quietly, how regularly has everything gone on. Not a flower has missed its time of blossoming or failed to perfect its fruit. Not the least root has lost itself under the snows, so as not to be ready for its fresh leaves and blossoms when the sun returns to melt the frosty chains of winter. We have storms sometimes that threaten to shake everything to pieces. The thunder roars, the lightning flashes, and the winds howl and beat, but when all is past, everything comes out better and brighter than before. But man comes, and it seems to be his glory to be able to destroy in a few hours what it was the work of ages to produce. Which of these dolls could make a tree? I'd like to see them do anything like it. How noisy and clumsy are all their movements, chopping, pounding, rasping, hammering. In the forest we do everything so quietly. A tree would be ashamed of itself that could not get its growth without making such a noise and dust and fuss. In spite of all this disquiet about it, the little cottage grew and was finished. The walls were covered with pretty paper, the floors carpeted with pretty carpets, and in fact, when it was all arranged and the garden walks lay out and beds of flowers planted around it, it began to be confessed that it was not after all so bad a thing as was to have been feared. A black ant went in one day and made a tour of exploration up and down over chairs and tables, up the ceilings and down again, and coming out wrote an article for the Cricket's Gazette, in which he described the new abode as a variable place. Several butterflies fluttered in and sailed about and were wonderful delighted. And then a bumblebee or two or three honeybees, who expressed themselves well pleased with the house, but more especially with the garden. In fact, when it was found that the proprietors watched and spared the anemones, and the violets and blood roots, and dogs tooth violets, and little woolly roots of fern that began to grow under the trees in spring, that they never allow a gun to be fired to scare the birds, and watched the building of their nests with the greatest interest. Then an opinion in favor of human beings began to gain ground, and every cricket and bird beast was loud in their praise. Mama, said Jan Tidbeet, a frisky young squirrel, to his mother one day, why don't you let Frisky and me go into that pretty new cottage to play? My dear, said his mother, who was very wary and careful old squirrel, how can you think of it? The race of men are full of devices for traps, and who could say that might happen? If you put yourself in the power, if you have wings like the butterflies and bees, you might fly in and out again, but as matters stand, it's best for you to keep well out of their way. But, mother, there is such a nice good lady lives there. I believe she is a good fairy, and she seems to love us all so. She sits in the bow window and watches us for hours, and she scatters corn all round at the roots of the trees for us to eat. She is nice enough, said the old mother squirrel, if you keep far off, but I tell you, you can't be too careful. Now this good fairy was a nice little old lady that the children used to call Aunt Esther, and she was a dear lover of birds and squirrels and all sorts of animals, and had studied their little ways till she knew just what would please them, and so she would every day throw out crumbs for the sparrows, and little bit of bread and wool and cotton to help the birds that were building their nest, and would scatter corn and nuts for the squirrels, and while she sat at her work in the bow window, she was smiled to see the squirrel flying away with the wool, and the squirrels nibbled their nets. After a while, 
The birds grew so tame that they would hop into the bow window and eat their crumbs off their carpet. Dear Mama, said Tidbit and Frisky, only see, Jenny Wren and Cock Robin have been in at the bow window, and it didn't hurt them, and why can't we go? Well, my dears, said old Mother Squirrel, you must do it very carefully. Never forget that you have wings like Jenny Wren and Cock Robin. So the next day, Aunt Esther laid a train of corn from the roots of the trees to the bow window, and then from the bow window to her work basket, which stood on the floor beside her. And then she put a quite a handful of corn in the work basket and sat down by it, and seemed intent on her sewing. Very soon, creep, 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 came Tit, Beat, and Frisky to the window, and then into the room, just as sly and as still as could be, and Aunt Esther sat just like a statue for fear of disturbing them. They looked all around in high glee, and when they came to the basket, it seemed to them a wonderful little summer house, made on purpose for them to play in. They nosed about in it, and turned over the scissors and the needlework, and took a needle and heard white walks, and jostled the spools, meanwhile stowing away the corn each side of the little chops. At last, an Esther put out her hand to touch them, when whisk frisk out they went and up the trees chattering and laughing before she had time even to wink but after this they used to come in every day and when she put corn in her hand and held it very still they would eat out of it and finally they would get into the hand until one day she gently closed it over them and frisky and tidbit were fairly caught oh how their hearts beat but the good fairy only spoke gently to them and soon unclosed her hand and let them go again. So, day after day, they grew to have more and more faith in her, till they would climb into her work basket, sit on her shoulder, or nestle away in her lap as she sat sewing. My dear, said old mother red one winter to her maid, what is the use of one's living in this cold hollow tree, when these amiable people have erected this pretty cottage where there is plenty of room for us and them too? Now I have examined between the eaves and there is a charming place where we can store our nuts and where we can whip in and out of the garret and have the free range of the house. And, say what you will, these humans have delightful ways of being warm and comfortable in winter. So Mr. and Mrs. Red set up housekeeping in the cottage and had no end of nuts and other good things stored up there. The trouble of all this was that as Mrs. Red got up to begin her housekeeping and woke up all her children at four o'clock in the morning, the good people often were disturbed by such a great rattling and fuss in the walls while yet it seemed dark night. What is it to be done about this we don't know. When our good people came down of a cold winter morning and see the squirrels dancing and frisking down the trees and chasing each other so merrily over the garden chair between them, or sitting with their tails saucily over their backs, they looked so jolly and jaunty and pretty that they almost forgive them for disturbing their night's rest and think that they will not do anything to drive them out of the garden today. And so it goes on. But how long the squirrels will rent the cottage in this fashion? I'm sure I dare not undertake to say. A bridge. End of section 91 by Donna Winters. End of In the Nursery of My Bookhouse by Oliver Prem Miller. Section 92 of In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Eaton. In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. Edited by Olive Beaupre Miller. The Sheep and the Pig that Made a Home. A Norse Folk Tale. Once upon a time there was a sheep, and he started out into the world to build himself a home. First he went to the pig and he said, there is nothing like having a home of your own. If you are of my way of thinking, we will go into the woods and build a house and live by ourselves. Yes, the pig was quite willing. It's nice to be in good company, said he, and off they started. When they had got a bit on the way, they met a goose. Good day, my good people. Where are you off to? said the goose. 
"'Good day,' answered the sheep. "'We're off to the woods to build us a house and live by ourselves.' "'Well, I'm very comfortable where I am,' said the goose. "'But why shouldn't I join you?' "'Neither hut nor house can be built by gobbling and quacking,' said the pig. "'What can you do to help us build?' "'I can pluck moss and stuff it into the holes between the logs, "'so the house will be warm and cosy. said the goose. "'Very well, you may come along then,' said the sheep and the pig. "'When they had gone a bit on the way, the goose was not getting along very fast. "'They met a hare who came scampering out of the woods. "'Good day, my good people,' said the hare. "'Where are you going today?' "'Good day,' answered the sheep. "'We're off to the woods to build a house and live by ourselves.' "'When you have tried both east and west, "'you'll find that a home of your own is the best.' "'Well,' said the hare, "'I live comfortably in every bush, "'but still I've a good mind to go and build the home with you.' "'But what can you do to help us build?' asked the pig. "'Nothing at all, I should say.' "'There is always something for willing hands to do in this world,' said the hare. "'I have sharp teeth to gnaw pegs with, "'and I have paws to knock them into the walls. "'So I'll do very well for a carpenter,' said the hare. "'Well, you may come along with us, then,' said the sheep, the pig, and the goose. "'When they had got a bit further on the way, they met a cock. "'Good day, my good people,' said the cock. "'Where are you all going today?' "'Good day,' said the sheep. "'We're off to the woods to build a house and live by ourselves. "'For unless at home you bake, what will you do for bread and cake?' "'Well, I am comfortable enough where I am,' said the cock. "'But it's better to have your own roost than to sit on a neighbour's roost and crow. "'And that cock is best off who has a home of his own.' If I could join such good company as yours, I too should like to go to the woods and build a house. Flapping and crowing is all very well for noise, but it won't build a house, said the pig. How can you help us to build? It is not well to live in a house where there is neither a dog nor a cock to awaken you in the morning, answered the cock. I rise very early and can awaken you all with my crowing. Early to rise makes one happy and wealthy and wise, said the pig, who found it very hard to wake up in the morning. Let the cock come along then so we'll lose no good daylight in sleeping, but be up with the sun and at work. So they all set off to the woods and built the house. The pig cut down the trees and the sheep dragged them home. The hare was the carpenter and gnawed pegs and hammered them into walls and roof. The goose plucked moss and stuffed it into the little holes between the logs. The cock crew and took care that they did not oversleep themselves in the mornings. When the house was ready and the roof covered with birch bark and thatched with grass, they all lived together and were both happy and contented in each other's company. They often, all of them, said, It's pleasant to travel both east and west, but home is after all the best. End of section 92all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Capricia Page. In the Nursery of My Bookhouse, edited by Olive Beaupre Miller. A Laughing Song by William Blake. When the green woods laugh with a voice of joy, and the dimpling stream runs laughing by, when the air does laugh with our merry wit, and the green hill laughs with the noise of it. When the meadows laugh with lively green, and the grasshopper laughs in the merry scene, when Mary and Susan and Emily with their sweet round mouths sing ha ha he, when the painted birds laugh in the shade, Where our table with cherries and nuts is spread, Come live and be merry, and join with me To sing the sweet chorus of Ha Ha He. End of section 93 Recording by Capricia Page Section 94 of In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeannie Hall. In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. Edited by Olive Beaupre Miller. How the Home Was Built by Maud Lindsay. 
Once there was a very dear family. Father, mother, big brother Tom, little sister Polly, and the baby, who had a very long name, Gustavus Adolphus. And every one of the family wanted a home more than anything else in the world. They lived in a house, of course, but that was rented, and they wanted a home of their very own, with a sunny room for mother and father and baby, with a wee room close by for the little sister, a big airy room for brother Tom, a cozy room for the cooking and eating, and best of all, a room that grandmother might call her own when she came to see them. A box which Tom had made always stood on mother's mantel, and they called it the home bank, because every penny that could be spared was dropped in there for the building of the home. This box had been full once, and was emptied to buy a little piece of ground where the home could be built when the box was full again. The box filled very slowly, though, and Gustavus Adolphus was nearly three years old when one day the father came in with a beaming face and called the family to him. Mother left her baking, and Tom came in from his work, and after Polly had brought the baby, the father asked them very solemnly, Now, what do we all want more than anything else in the world? A home, said mother and brother Tom. A home, said little sister Polly. Home, said the baby, Gustavus Adolphus, because his mother had said it. Well, said the father, I think we shall have our home if each one of us will help. I must go away to the great forest, where the trees grow so tall and fine. All winter long I must chop the trees down, and in the spring I shall be paid in lumber, which will help in the building of the home. While I am away, Mother will have to fill my place, and her own, too, for she will have to go to market, buy the coal, keep the pantry full, and pay the bills, as well as cook and wash and sew, take care of the children, and keep a brave heart till I come back again. The Mother was willing to do all this and more, too, for the dear home, and Brother Tom asked eagerly, "'What can I do? What can I do?' "'for he wanted to begin work right then without waiting a moment. "'I have found you a place in the carpenter's shop where I work,' answered the father, "'and you will work for him and all the while be learning to saw and hammer and plane "'so that you will be ready in the spring to help build the home.' "'Now this pleased Tom so much that he threw his cap in the air and hurrahed, "'which made the baby laugh, but little Polly did not laugh. "'because she was afraid that she was too small to help. "'But after a while the father said, "'I shall be away in the great forest cutting down the trees. "'Mother will be washing and sewing and baking. "'Tom will be at work in the carpenter's shop. "'And who will take care of the baby?' "'I will, I will!' cried Polly, running to kiss the baby. "'And the baby can be good and sweet.' "'So it was all arranged that they would have their dear little home.' which would belong to everyone, because each one would help, and the father made haste to prepare for the winter. He stored away the firewood and put up the stoves, and when the woodchoppers went to the great forest, he was ready to go with them. Out in the forest the trees were waiting. Nobody knew how many years they had waited there, growing every year stronger and more beautiful for the work they had to do. Every one of them had grown from a baby tree to a giant, and when the choppers came, there stood the giant trees, so bare and still in the wintry weather that the sound of the axes rang from one end of the woods to the other. From sunrise to sunset the men worked steadily, and although it was lonely in the woods when the snow lay white on the ground and the cold wind blew, the father kept his heart cheery. At night, when the men sat about the fire in their great log house, he would tell them about the mother and children who were working with him for a home. Nobody's axe was sharper than his or felled so many trees, and nobody was gladder when the springtime came and the logs were hauled down to the river. The river had been waiting, too, through all the winter under its shield of ice, but now that spring had come and the snows were melting and all the little mountain streams were tumbling down to help, 
the river grew very broad and strong, and dashed along, snatching the logs when the men pushed them in, and carrying them on with a rush and a roar. The men followed close along the bank of the river, to watch the logs and keep them moving, but at last there came a time when the logs would not move, but lay in a jam from shore to shore, while the water foamed about them. "'Who will go out to break the jam?' said the men. They knew that only a brave man and a nimble man could go, for there was danger that the river might sweep him away. They looked at each other, but the father was not afraid, and he was sure-footed and nimble, so he sprang out in a moment with his axe and began to cut away at the logs. "'Some of these logs may help to build a home,' he said, and he found the very log that was holding the others tight, and as soon as that was loosened the logs began to move. "'Jump, jump!' cried the men, as they ran for their lives, and just as the logs dashed on, with a rumble and a jumble and a jar that sent some of the logs flying up in the air, the father reached the bank safely. The hard work was over now. After the logs had rested in the log boom, they went on their way to the sawmills, where they were sawed into lumber to build houses, and then the father hurried home. When he came there, he found that the mother had baked and washed and sewed and taken care of the children, as only such a precious mother could have done. Brother Tom had worked so well in the carpenter's shop that he knew how to hammer and plane and saw, and had grown as tall and as stout as a young pine tree. Sister Polly had taken such care of the baby that he looked as sweet and clean and happy as a rose in a garden, and the baby had been so good that he was a joy to the whole family. "'I must get this dear family into their home,' said the father, and he and Brother Tom went to work with a will, and the home was built with a sunny room for father and mother and baby, a wee little room close by for good sister Polly, a big airy room for big brother Tom, a cozy room for the cooking and eating, and best of all, a room for the dear grandmother.' who came then to live with them all the time. End of section 94 Recording by Jeannie Hall, Eldersburg, Maryland Section 95 of In the Nursery of My Book House This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Timmy. In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. Edited by Olive Beaupre Miller. The Flag Goes By. By Henry Holcomb Bennett. Hats off. Along the street there comes a blare of bugles, a ruffle of drums, a flash of color beneath the sky. Hats off. The flag is passing by. Blue and crimson and white it shines. Over the steel-tipped, ordered lines, hats off. The colors before us fly, but more than the flag is passing by. Sign of a nation, great and strong, toward her people from foreign wrong. Pride and glory and honor, all live in the colors to stand or fall. Hats off. Along the street there comes a blare of bugles, a ruffle of drums, and loyal hearts are beating high. Hats off. The flag is passing by. End of 95section 96 of in the nursery of my bookhouse this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by rebecca in the nursery of my bookhouse edited by olive bopri miller late by josephine preston peabody my father brought somebody up to show us all asleep. They came as softly up the stairs as you could creep. They whispered in the doorway there and looked at us a while. I had my eyes shut up, but I could feel him smile. I shut my eyes up close and lay as still as I could keep because I knew he wanted us to be asleep. End of section 96. Recording by Rebecca.
Section 97 of In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amy Graymore. In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. Edited by Olive Beaupre Miller. Noah's Ark. It came to pass a long time ago that floods of water covered the earth to wash it clean of all that was not pure. But Noah was a just man, and good above all men, so God spoke to him to save him from the flood. God said unto Noah, Make thee an ark of wood that will float upon the waters, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons, and thy wife, and thy sons' wives with thee, and of every living thing, of birds and beasts, and every creeping thing that creepeth on the earth, two of every sort shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. And Noah did according unto all that God commanded him. He builded the ark, and went into it, he and his sons, and his wife, and his sons' wives with him. Of beasts and birds, and every creeping thing that creepeth on the earth, there went in unto Noah two of every sort. And it came to pass, after seven days, that the waters of the flood were upon the earth, and the rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights, and the waters bare up the ark and it was lifted up above the earth and floated upon the face of the waters. All the high hills were covered, and the mountains were covered, till all that was not good was washed away. Noah only remained upon the earth, and they that were with him in the ark, and the waters lasted an hundred and fifty days. But God remembered Noah, and made a wind to pass over the earth, so the waters rose no more. Then the ark rested upon a mountain." At the end of forty days Noah opened the window of the ark and sent forth a raven. Also he sent forth a dove to see if the waters were off the face of the ground. But the dove found no place to rest her feet, for the waters were still on the face of the whole earth, and she returned unto him. And he stayed yet another seven days, and again he sent forth the dove out of the ark, and the dove came in to him in the evening, and lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf that she had plucked. So Noah knew the waters were sunk down beneath the treetops, and he stayed yet another seven days, and sent forth the dove, which returned not again unto him any more, for the waters were dried up from off the earth. Then Noah removed the covering of the ark, and looked, and, behold, the face of the ground was dry. And God spake unto Noah, saying, Go forth out of the ark, thou and thy wife and thy sons and thy sons' wives with thee. Bring forth with thee every living thing of bird and of beasts and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And Noah went forth, and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. Every beast, every bird, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth went forth out of the ark. And Noah offered thanks unto God, because God had saved them from the flood. And God blessed Noah and his sons, and bade them to do good continually. And God set in the sky the rainbow to be for an everlasting sign that unto those who do good his mercy and loving kindness shall last for ever. End of section ninety seven. Section ninety eight of In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rebecca, www.bluebird-experience.com In the Nursery of My Bookhouse, edited by Olive Beaupre Miller, The Bow That Bridges Heaven, by Christina G. Rossetti Boats sail on the rivers, and ships sail on the seas. But clouds that sail across the skies are prettier than these. There are bridges in the river, as pretty as you please, but the bow that bridges heaven and overtops the trees, and builds a roof from earth to sky, is prettier far than these. End of section 98. Recording by Rebecca. Section 99 of In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Eaton In the Nursery of My Book House Edited by Olive Beaupre Miller The Hare and the Tortoise The Hare and the Tortoise, adapted from Aesop A hare once said boastfully that he could run faster than any of the other animals. I have never yet been beaten, said he, and I never shall be. I dare anyone here to run a race with me. The tortoise answered quietly, I will run a race with you. You, laughed the hare. Ha, 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 that is a good joke. A turtle run a race with a hare. Why, I could dance around such a slow poke as you all the way and still reach the goal first. Keep such big talk until you've truly won the race, said the tortoise. But the hare continued to laugh. Ho, 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 ha, ha, ha. A turtle run a race with a hare. Everybody come and see. The turtle would run a race with the hare. All the little forest folk heard and came up to see the fun. Well, 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 said a raccoon to a woodchuck. Think of it. Friend turtle, whose legs are so short he can hardly crawl, will run a race with the hare. Why, the hare's hind legs are so long, he can go at one leap as far as friend turtle can creep in fifty slow steps. So the raccoon laughed, and the woodchuck laughed, and all the little forest folk laughed. But the tortoise still stuck to it that he would run the race. So they decided on a starting place, and on the road they should run to the goal. Then they put their toes to the line and made ready. One, two, three, go, shouted the raccoon. They were off. The hare darted almost out of sight at once, but when he had gone halfway he stopped. Just to show how certain he was of reaching the goal ahead of the tortoise, he lay down in the middle of the road and went to sleep. He slept and he slept and he slept, but the tortoise plodded on and plodded on and plodded on. At last when the hare awoke from his nap, lo and behold, he saw the tortoise had gone all the way round the race course and was back again near the winning post. Then, though he ran as fast as he could to make up for the lost time, he could not reach the goal until after the tortoise. Three cheers for friend Turtle! Hurrah! 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 shouted all the little forest people, but the tortoise said quietly to the hare, He who keeps steadily at work always comes out ahead. End of section 99《Section 100 of In the Nursery of My Book House》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Eaton In the Nursery of My Book House Edited by Olive Beaupre Miller Spring by Celia Thaxter The alder by the river Shakes out her powdery curls the willow buds in silver for little boys and girls. The little birds fly over, and oh, how sweet they sing to tell the happy children that once again tis spring. The gay green grass comes creeping so soft beneath their feet. The frogs begin to ripple, a music clear and sweet. And buttercups are coming, and scarlet columbine, and in the sunny meadows the dandelions shine. And just as many daisies as their soft hands can hold, the little ones may gather, all fair in white and gold. Here blows the warm red clover, there peeps the violet blue. Oh, happy little children, God made them all for you. End of section 100